working on it. Yeah, so Mary, I just wanted to clarify, is that the YouTube link? I don't know. Um, I'll pull up the text again. And I think they just said we're getting looped and didn't, didn't give me specifics. Uh, let's see. Robert, um, yeah. I'll pull up the text looks, again. I think they just said we're getting looped. Yep, looks like it's working. Okay, great. Could you transfer host duties back to me? You bet. Greg, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm wondering if you'd be willing to change your name. I see it's coming up as Michelle Tate. Do you remember how we did that yesterday? Yes, okay. okay. Let me know if you need uh, any instructions. Let's see what I can see here. I, I've switched over. I need to switch over to my laptop okay. um, because of some corruption with my Adobe. So I can't open my documents and uh, PDFs in my laptop, only in my desktop. So I'm, in order to have a bigger screen, I'm putting the documents on my desktop. So anyway, that's okay. just to say that I'm not seeing this side all right now trying to make enough space for that to okay. show up sure no problem um and it's not so i just have a just a, a empty black column there okay to the right of the screen um if you click on the participants logo in your bottom of your screen, it should pull up a list of participants on the right hand side. Whoops. Okay, I just. And actually, let me make this easy for you. Let's see. Oh, da -da. Let, me... Okay, let me see if I can get maybe full screen. Okay, gallery, a gallery view will bring up everything. Let's see. Do you have um, icons at the bottom of your screen that say participants or chat? Um, I don't. Um, well, yeah, yeah, I have participants chat. Okay, so I'll put the, I'll click on participants. Okay, so that's showing up. And then, um, let's see. Yeah, okay, that's just in different locations from the desktop, so that kind of threw Oh, up. actually, you know what? I can go ahead and rename you now. Um, can you remind me how to spell your last name? <laughs> that's W O. L L E Y one O two L E Y so W O L L E Y and and Greg with one G yes or I usually use my full name for my commission okay uh, Gregory yeah with one or two G's in the middle uh, two G's one in the beginning and one later <laughs> okay got it got it okay see if I got that right for you take a look at your screen that looks great thank you. All right, so you should be good to go. Okay. So we. Oh, Jill, I'm sorry. I think I muted you right in the middle of you speaking. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I unmuted. Good. So yeah, um, I know we're waiting for a few more folks to arrive, but for those of you who are um, new to Zoom, um, on your bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom window, you should have a mute button. And what we'll ask is that everyone um, mutes themselves to prevent background noise so we can better hear each other. Um, and then you can go ahead and unmute yourself um, in the meeting to speak. Um, you also have a logo in the bottom middle that says participants. And if you click that, you can see a list to your right hand side of those panelists. So that would be commission members and staff that are presenting and participating. And then you should also have at the very top, a second list that you can click on that are attendees. And these would be folks who are observers. Um, who are unable to participate verbally. Okay. 
sorry, this is Becky. Can you, can you go through that part again? The yeah. observe the. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. do you have a participants icon at the bottom of your screen? Yes. Okay. If you were to click that, it should bring to your right hand side of your zoom window, a list of people who are in the meeting. Yep. Okay. So at the very top, you should see in blue where it says panelists. Mm -hmm. So that is the panelist list that is below. So that would be all commission members and those staff presenting and participating in the meeting. And to the right of the panelist, the blue panelist is uh, attendees, okay. which cur currently says zero. But if you were to click on that, that would show you all the folks who are attending the meeting as observers, but unable to speak. Okay, so like, will the presentations come in under attendees? So um, the presenters will be on the panelist list, and then the actual PowerPoint presentations should appear on your screen um, in the middle of your screen when we share it at that time. And you will have on the right hand side, um, or sometimes some of you will see it on the upper right, um, a cluster of, of the video faces. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. You also should know that in the upper right hand corner of your window, um, there is a place to toggle between speaker view and gallery view. So you should have a, a small icon that says either speaker view or gallery view, depending on the view you currently are in. Gallery view allows you to see all the faces of the people in the meeting currently. And speaker view will only highlight the person speaking at that time. Okay, so I'm not seeing Mary anymore. Did she drop off everyone's screen? It does look like she dropped off, yes. Oh, I can still see Mary. You see, you see Mary? Yes, is it's possible we've uh, exceeded the capacity of your screen. There might be a little arrow on the side where you can see more people. Oh, I see her. Yep, you're right. Okay, maybe Mary. I'll turn my video off. <laughs> I still have capacity, but I don't see Mary. I think, I think click it's more. part of the people at, at a time. Mm. Oh. Oh, you are. Okay, she's Kristen? back. Yep. Yes. Um, I won't be speaking during the meeting, so you can move me over to attendees. Okay. All right. Let me do. Okay. So, Michelle? Can Michelle hear me? Yeah, she should be able to hear you. Yeah. Oh, I can. Uh, I'm just checking me? Michelle on material. So we have this, we have the I have the agenda, I have the field report, I have the combined exhibits that you sent. And then I have uh, the field, let's see what else. Exhibit A um, separately. I mean, I just want to just make sure everybody we all have everything and if there's anything that we yep. should have. So there was very there was very few materials that came out this month. So you'll have your agenda, your field report, um, the financial report, and then the meeting minutes from the February meeting that we will be um, approving, and then the combined um, presentation. And the reason I went ahead and sent the combined presentation instead of sending those individually is so that if we're going back they are going to be page numbered and we'll be able to reference the page number if we need to go back to a slide. And that's everything you should have. Thank you. Do folks have any other questions about Zoom or um, any of sort of the functionality of this tool? I don't have that, but do we know if the people who are trying to watch and listen are now on or if we sorted that issue? So um, Robert has made this live on YouTube. Um, we have not begun recording or broadcasting. So we'll do that um, just before nine o'clock. Okay. 
And maybe um, we're we're not sure exactly which link you were talking about where where people can't um, get get to it. But Tim checked it, and the links are correct. But there is one link to the agenda right above a link that goes to the video, and so people might just be missing. I think the wrong one. I'll text them just to double check. <laughs> and uh, commissioners, this is Kurt Elcher. Um, I'm assuming you can pick me up at this point, but I, I wanted to, before we get started here with our, our uh, official meeting, I did want to just mention that um, and, and yes, I am sitting in Commissioner Hatfield Hyde's seat. Yes. So yes, there you go. Okay, I, I can tell you can hear me because I got the thumbs up from her. Um, I, I did want to say that it, it, it's probably going to be a little bit awkward as we manage through this meeting uh, in terms of um, uh, commissioners that may have questions. And so uh, I will... And of course, I'm not sitting next to the chair, so I, I can't, uh, you know, whisper things in her ear in terms of who has a question. So just uh, bear with us in the awkwardness of um, of uh, actually running the meeting and uh, calling on you all that might have questions. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. And and I'm in your Gold Beach office, so you could probably get to me, you know, five hours. <laughs> You know, I knew, I knew that looked familiar and I was thinking, gosh, that looks familiar. And I know I've never been to Mary's house. Now I know why it looks familiar. This is not my house. It's Bree's office. <laughs> yeah. So Kurt, on our Klamath call last week, we had a lot of people on Zoom and there was a, a way to like raise your hand under yeah. the um and then that way you know that we're trying to get in the queue is that just too much um uh technology to follow right now i mean i get it if it is but that's a way for people to be in the queue with each other Christine, yeah. can you talk about the procedure that we discussed yeah so thank you for raising that becky um so we will use that feature and to find that feature um, you would click again on that participants icon at the bottom to bring up the list on the other on that side um, mark has just demonstrated that uh, how to use that um, so you should be able to um, see at the bottom of the list uh, a raise hand feature mm -hmm. if you don't see it you may need to expand your window just a little bit more uh, to be able to do that. Are you able to see that okay? Anyone not able to see that? Okay, so yeah, what we will do, Davia will be managing um, the raised hand function. And just so you know, the raised hand function works for the panelists or people that whose videos you can see now, as well as the attendees who um, don't have access to speak. So Davia will be able to manage who has their hands raised and communicate that to Chair Wall um, throughout the meeting. Um, so Chair will, will um, pause at different times and call on folks um, in that way. Um, so, so Kristina, are you kind of in charge of muting, unmuting? Because we're, we're getting muted or unmuted as we go along. So is that something you're doing to just help to manage the background? Yeah, yeah. So people can mute and unmute themselves, but um, I will be kind of tracking if people are not in the current, you know, interactions, I will be tracking if there's um, background noise or that kind of thing and, and muting folks. Um, and in the orient, my orientation comments, I'll let people know that procedure is to keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking uh, to kind of prevent that background noise and make it easier to hear each other. Thanks. Yeah. Mary, how are you doing? 
it, it's it's Greg. I'm just seeing how you're doing. I'm doing fine, and I'm just trying to get um, information to Davia about the person that was dialing in, and I I don't have a way to forward that Davia, but. Um, it was Bob Salinger from Audubon. If you have his information or I can give it to you. Um, yeah, I have his phone number. I will send him a message. Perfect, thank you. He was also saying, be careful with Zoom, Zoom humming because he's been on a couple that have been, that's happened lately, so. But just an FYI for everybody, um, in particularly Director Melcher, I got a, an opportunity to listen in on the commercial squid public hearing last night. And I was pretty impressed. There was like 85 people that were on that Zoom, uh, or I guess it wasn't Zoom, it was uh, another format. But anyway, it was uh, well done by staff and I think they got some good input. So it's uh, I was amazed at how many squid are Land like 8 million pounds of squid have been landed so far this year. So it's a good learning experience for me. Well, thanks, Commissioner. Appreciate, appreciate that feedback. Well, thanks, Commissioner. Appreciate, appreciate that feedback. Kurt, Kurt you had an echo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard that. I have an echo here now. No. Maybe I was talking too loud and Davia's headphone was picking me up or something. No. Hey, Kirk, can you hear me? Yep. Good morning, uh, Commissioner. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Spell Ring. Uh, yep. hey, I really think the department's been doing a great job. Uh, you know, handling this whole episode with the coronavirus and stuff. I, I know, you know, talking to a bunch of the sport fishermen, they really appreciate what the department's been doing, trying to keep things open. And, and I think they've been doing a good job too of getting the people aware of the social distancing. I heard down there at Oregon City one day, they were getting kind of close and the sheriff came out and said, uh, hey, uh, you need, this isn't going to work, you know, to stay close like this. They were big hog line and stuff. And the next day they cleaned it right up and stuff. So I, I think overall I've heard nothing but positive. I really think you guys have been doing a good job. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, I, I want to be careful that we're not having any uh, uh, illegal public meetings here. So I, I appreciate those comments and we'll, we'll feel free to share those when we get on the, on the actual meeting. Um, I just want to be extra careful here amongst us. So we can talk about procedural things, but I do appreciate that feedback, Bob.
Morning, everyone. Good morning. morning Tucker. Hi, Tucker. So this is Kristen. I just want to let everybody know that we went ahead and, and started broadcasting um, so that attendees can start to assemble. Um, you should be able to see on the right hand side a list of attendees. Um, again, if you're curious about who's attending. And just for clarification uh, for commissioners that are on the phone, the, so that attendees can start to assemble. the attendees are on uh, through the Zoom meeting and they will be available if we want to switch them to a participant uh, to answer any questions. And But then the rest of the general public is viewing through the YouTube channel. Um, Kristen? I think we'll need to start a new stream. Can you um, hand me back the controls? Yes, I can. Okay, there you go. I think we're going live right now. Can you transfer host duties back to me? Yep. Thank you. Just make sure it's up and running. Great. Okay, we're live. Thank you, Robert. And Kristen, just so you know, I just got another text that it sounds like the public person that was not able to get through is able to. So it looks like it's working on that side too. Okay, great. Glad to hear that. And just so everybody knows, as soon as we um, call the meeting to order, I'll ask Kristen to walk through for a quick orientation so people will have that and everybody will get to hear it.
Kristen, a qu quick question as we start. Are you able to hear any background noise in the, or background sounds from the office here where I am? Yes, I'm, a, I'm hearing a, I can't make out what he's saying, but I hear a gentleman in the background. Okay. Um, I'll mute whenever I can, um, but for now, if I can, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order the, the April 17th meeting of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'm Mary Wall. There are six commissioners on the call today on the video. Um, Greg Woolley, Bob Spellbrink, Mark Labhart, Jill Zarnowitz, Becky Hatfield-Hyde, and myself. Um, we will go right now to hear from the person who is helping us with the virtual platform, Kristen Wright, and then we'll come back and start the meeting. Great, thank you, Chair Wall. So hello, my name is Kristen Wright. I work at the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University. Our center advances the use of collaborative governance methods in Oregon and nationally through a variety of services, education, and research that help people collaborate to address public issues and implement community-based solutions. Today, I'm here to provide technical support to the commission and the ODFNW staff to be able to hold this commission meeting virtually through Zoom. We're pleased that you all are here on Zoom or uh, watching via YouTube, and we really appreciate your patience with us as we adapt to this new virtual uh, world. I have a few comments just to orient you to the Zoom meeting platform before I turn it back over to Chair Wall to continue our meeting. So first, uh, only commissioners and presenting or participating staff will be visible on the screen. And to help us with communication and meeting management, we ask that those commissioners and participating staff do a few things. First, keep yourself muted to limit background noise. You will see a mute button is located at the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom screen. And we ask that you wait until you're recognized by the chair uh, before unmuting yourself to speak. Second, we ask that you use the digital raise hand feature to signal if you have a question or a comment and then wait to be recognized by the chair. You can find this feature by clicking on the participants logo at the bottom of your screen. This will open a list of meeting participants to the right. And at the bottom of that list, will be a raised hand icon. You may be able to, you not, may not be able to see that um, if your screen is too small, so you may need to expand your screen to view that, that feature. Lastly, uh, we do have a chat feature available, but we ask you to um, limit your use of that as it's distracting for participants um, and understand also that the chat will be saved as part of the public record. So for those of you participating, again, we ask you to keep yourself muted unless you've been recognized to speak, use the digital raise hand feature and limit the use of the chat feature. Lastly, we also have um, observing non-participating attendees um, that are not visible on the screen. Um, if you are uh, one of those attendees, you will not be able to mute or unmute yourself, but you will be able to use the raise hand feature which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, some of the observing attendees might be asked to participate in the meeting by the chair or commissioners. And at that time, I will announce that I'm switching your role from an observing attendee to a participant. There will be a small blip on your screen and then you will be able to unmute yourself to speak. Your video also will be live at that time. Once your participation is complete, we will then be moved back to an observing attendee status. Uh, any of your observer or attendee questions or comments um, can also be mail emailed to Davia. Her email is davia, D-A-V-I-A dot M dot Palmeri, P-A-L-M-E-R-I at state dot or dot U-S. So she will help to ensure that there's a response to your question or comment as well. So lastly, I would mention um, that we will have a reboot contingency plan. So if there are technical issues, um, I will end the meeting and restart it. And you will need to log back in using the Zoom link you use to enter this meeting now. 
And in the event of inappropriate disruption, some people um, are, are calling the Zoom bombing. Um, uh, I will first try to remove that person from the meeting before rebooting the meeting. We're very happy to have you here. And with that, I will hand it back to Chair Wall. Thank you, Kristen. Could I ask you to do to um, respond to two questions? The first is, this will be a relatively long meeting. So could you mention how people should um, get back on if we take a break? Yeah, so if uh, in, when we take a break, you will want to mute yourself and stop your video. Instead of logging off, just leave your Zoom window open, mute and stop your video. And then um, Chair Wall will let us know um, how long our break is and when you should return. At that point, when we return, you can just unmute and, and restart your video. And the last, the second question and the last one is, could you also mention when people should um, stop their video? Or if there are, I don't know if there's any kind of protocol for that. Yeah, I think what we've been trying to do um, just for the sake of ease of viewing those who are participating is that the commission members would leave their video on and those staff that are presenting or participating would start their video um, during the time of their participation and otherwise uh, leave their video uh, turned off. Thank you, Kristen, and good morning again to everybody. Um, I'm glad you're all here, and thank you for going the extra steps to be in this meeting. Um, this one is, as I think you know, informational only, with two exceptions. We'll have the February minutes to approve, and we do have temporary rules to approve. Um, at this point, we're unlikely to have a May meeting, but by June, we definitely plan to be up and running so that we can have public participation, which is important to us. And we want to be back there having um, and supporting public participation. Um, and commissioners, you should know that for the June meeting, please hold both days because that's likely to be a long one since we won't be having a May meeting. Um, the other thing I'd like to do just very quickly before we start the regular meeting is to acknowledge and thank staff for um, how much harder your jobs have become in the last couple months, um, checking with the social distancing, still dealing with things like mule deer and white deer populations in Eastern Oregon, the North of Falcon, um, meetings all went ahead, um, getting people on virtual platforms and working from home. Um, the budget and the, the public budget part of the, um, the committee is still going to happen. It will happen virtually, but it will happen. Um, getting the Fish and Wildlife Commission actually started on this platform and a lot of other things. So I think I speak for the entire commission in thanking you and, and acknowledging that your jobs are a lot harder. So thank you. Um, let me check with Director Melcher to see if he has anything before we start. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, no, I do, uh, I do appreciate everyone and all the extra work that's gone into everything we do um, at the department over this last four weeks or five weeks. So um, we are ready to, to proceed. As you mentioned, this is essentially, this meeting is essentially an extended director's report where we will be uh, reporting to you all on a number of issues, um, both related to the uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic, as well as just uh, general work that the department is doing, including providing you with our uh, 2019 annual wolf uh, status report, which is, uh, which is required as part of the wolf plan. So um, unless any other commissioners wanted to say anything before we we get started here. I will uh, I will go through my director's report and call on the appropriate staff. All right. Uh, seeing no hands raised at this point, uh, virtual hands that is. Although you could uh, literally raise your hand too, and if and we could see that on the screen, and we would uh, certainly respond. But we did provide to you the uh, field report in written format. Um, we, we contemplated not doing that, but then we decided that since um, really the department's field work largely continues here, we wanted to 
uh, show you all and, and show the public that uh, we are still working. Uh, we're working differently in many cases, but uh, the field work continues. So we did provide those in written form. Uh, first, uh, the first presentation, uh, we wanted to give you an update, an overview on the COVID-19 situation as it, replied, as, it re, um, as it applies to the department's work. And so uh, somewhere out here in the ether, I have uh, Deputy Director Erica Kleiner and Deputy Director Shannon Hearn that will go through their presentation. All right, thank you, Director Melcher. Good morning, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioners. For the record, I'm Erica Kleiner, Deputy Director for Administration. I appreciate the opportunity today to connect with you all um, and kind of recap how the COVID-19 situation has affected us here at ODFW and how we've responded to that. So the presentation um, is going to be broken up in um, two different sections. So I'll cover um, kind of the internal impact of the agency. I'm going to talk about um, resources that we've provided to employees and a couple of the um, governor's executive orders. And then Deputy Director Hearn is going to cover um, public impacts and also guidance that we've given to hunters and anglers. So next slide, please, Kristen. Thank you. And then we'll end uh, the presentation with the opportunity to have a dialogue and for you to ask questions. Next slide. All right. Uh, so February 28th, we had our first positive case of COVID-19 in Oregon. Um, March 2nd, we had our first staff communication um, sent out. And March 8th, Governor Brown declared a state of emergency in Oregon. Um, really early March, um, we were focused on um, our continuity of operations plans. I'm really dusting those off and tweaking them as appropriate to the pandemic situation. We were also focused on identifying resources for our staff as they navigated this, um, notifying all of our essential staff um, of their obligations to continue to perform their duties in the event of a government shutdown. Uh, we were coordinating uh, closure efforts with a myriad of partners and synthesizing and disseminating information as uh, we got it from both the Department of Administrative Services and the Oregon Health Authority. So I'm gonna jump straight into uh, key resources that we provided to staff. And um, the first one I wanted to mention is our ODFW Inside page. So this is a web page we created very early on to serve as a central repository for all of our COVID-19 related information. So we wanted a place that staff could go to obtain information easily. Um, on that page, we have links to all of the guidance that we've received from DAS, from Oregon Health Authority, Office of Emergency Management, and the Governor's Office. We also um, post information on recreating outdoors. Um, and then talking points for staff, so as we've had um, as we've continued to have hunting and uh, angling seasons open, we want um, staff to have those talking points so that they can give a consistent message to the public. Um, we have environmental cleaning and hygiene information posted on that page, especially um, appropriate for staff who continue to work in our facilities. And then we have COVID related emails that we've sent out um, to staff and in some cases to managers, just for again, easy reference. Um, we do have two HR um, human resources safety specialists um, that have shared information with staff throughout this pandemic. Um, they've been uh, mostly sharing information on how to recognize COVID symptoms and other safety information. Um, as an example, they sent out communication to staff that highlighted kind of the differences between a seasonal cold or allergy and COVID symptoms. So they've been keeping staff informed as they get information from Oregon Health Authority. They're also a resource if staff has questions about personal protective equipment. Um, there was some uh, recent communication from the federal government about face masks. So they are um, resources for those issues. I also wanted to highlight um, technical resources. Um, as we've had a large contingency of our workforce um, transition to telework, um, they have been doing a tremendous amount of work and support um, to make that process seamless. Um, they uh, distributed um, approximately 150 laptops to staff over a two-week period. 
So that was updating those machines, configuring those machines, making sure those machines remain secure, and then educating staff on how to make that transition. So that's gone very well. Um, right in the, the middle of this, um, they implemented multi-factor authentication. Um, it's something that the state uh, mandated. We were That was already on our roadmap, luckily, um, and that process went very well for us. So we are very thankful to our technical support folks. Um, they've been more important than ever. They've also shared guidance on tools for virtual conferencing solutions, um, how to use Skype for business, um, let's see, cleaning standards for devices as folks have been handling more cell phones and laptops and remote email options. Uh, moving on to cleaning protocols, um, as you can imagine, um, especially for staff who remain in our facilities, there's been lots of concern over um, our cleaning protocol. So our administrative services division has really taken the lead um, to work with our janitorial service pr services provider to make sure that their cleaning protocols um, are really aimed at our community areas and our commonly touched surfaces and that the cleaning products that we use are really killing um, germs at this time. They've also um, shared information with our office managers um, throughout the department on how to make sure that we're um, doing what we should be to keep our facilities clean. Um, and then they've also been a big support for our staff as it's been difficult to procure um, some cleaning products. Moving on to employee self-care resources, um, Director Melcher sent out some communication that really promoted um, employee em emotional well-being. Um, obviously, staff are going through a lot, not just um, at their jobs, but at home, concerned about um, friends and family members. Um, and so that communication contained um, some information about counseling services um, and other uh, support services that they could take advantage of during this time. Um, COVID-19 signage, so our information and education folks have really been the point people to produce consistent signage. So that has been for, for facilities closures, um, no camping, hand washing, social distancing. So they've been a big support, um, especially to field offices who are, who are posting more signs. Um, next, increased support for managers. Um, the managers have been doing a yeoman's job the last month and a half to make sure that their folks have the information they need, they're making the transition to telework okay, um, that folks who are still in the office are practicing um, social distancing. Um, so they have just, um, their lives have changed. We appreciate everything they've done um, from the director's office and human resources um, side, we've been providing guidance on issues such as um, telework, who can telework, um, use of leave balances, office closures, social distancing in the workplace, um, and a myriad of other issues. And then finally, it's not so much an employee resource, but I wanted to mention um, our office closure to the public. So as you can imagine, um, our frontline staff um, had grave concerns about um, their interactions with the public. Um, it's very hard to tell a customer to back up or, you know, cover sneezes and coughs. And so they had a lot of concerns leading up to the office closure. So that was a huge support for them. Um, Kristen, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there's two of Governor Brown's executive orders um, I wanted to mention. Um, the first executive order 20-05 was the original workplace guidance that Governor Brown put out um, March 12th. And so this um, initially told us to limit any large gatherings, to modify our events and consider our virtual options, um, to practice uh, good, safe social distancing, and to encourage telework for folks who um, have job duties that could support that and as equipment is available. Um, her second executive order 20-21 built on that and put a greater emphasis on the social distancing components um, of the original guidance. Um, so we asked that staff ramp up our efforts wherever they could, um, take this very seriously. I think um, staff at ODFW always took it seriously, um, but we asked for even greater efforts to not only implement social distancing measures, but to enforce them um, to look for even more opportunities to telework and to reduce just any remaining in-person interactions. 
Um, I will say that we fully complied with all of those orders to the best of our abilities. Um, really, again, the credit goes to the managers um, throughout the agency and staff for coming together and thinking creatively, identifying solutions and making sure that we continue to fulfill our obligations to fish and wildlife populations, um, but we're also keeping ourselves safe and others safe as well. Um, with that, I'll go to the next slide. And Deputy yeah. Director Carmen will cover public impacts and guidance, and we'll take questions. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher, this is Janet Hearn, Deputy Director for Fish and Wildlife Programs. As Deputy Director Kleiner just described, a lot of our business operations have changed uh, related to COVID-19. I'll cover what social distancing and the stay home, save lives order means for public impacts. Um, as COVID-19 rolled out in Oregon, it became very apparent um, that some of our facilities were more susceptible um, to impacts from an outbreak. And one of those specifically is fish hatcheries. And so among our 27 fish hatcheries, one of the very first steps we took was to close public visitation to those facilities and they, they remain closed. Um, to public visitation. In some locations, there's still public access, um, so people can access rivers and things like that. And again, I'll, I'll say this throughout my presentation, um, we, we very much appreciate that the public is respecting those closures um, and not showing up in mass and, and access, accessing those properties. Uh, next, as Deputy Director Kleiner mentioned, uh, we had wildlife area camping closures occur, occur, and this occurred by temporary rule, and you'll see it in your temporary rule packet later on the agenda. Um, we looked at, at facilities and resources able to handle um, public camping and determined at that time um, it was safer and less risk to go ahead and, and close them to camping. However, all of our areas um, that were open remain open to day use. Um, we have a few that that are under closures um, for wildlife protection um, and some that are just opening up after those closures. But right now, currently, most of our properties are open to day use. As you know, this time of year, uh, it's a big time for sportsman shows, uh, folks getting out um, and ramping up and looking at their hunting and angling seasons. This is the time of year when we're doing auction and raffles, um, and that provides funding for dedicated funding for species conservation. Obviously, we can no longer do those. Uh, so Wildlife Division has made a lot of changes, holding most of them virtual, including the upcoming raffle. Moving on, uh, spring is also the time of year where we have a lot of outdoor workshops and a lot of hunter education going on. Um, unfortunately, we have had to close those down and make some significant changes there. Our information and education program is working with parents right now to look at what op options are for hunter education um, and working with folks very one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we have canceled dozens of workshops and they remain canceled um, for the immediate future until we know how can we can roll out and open things. About this time, as Deputy Director Kleiner mentioned, we started to see other properties close. State Parks was one of the first to do closures. Um, we've also seen local governments um, close boat ramps um, and other facilities that exist out there. We have been working with those local governments to ensure um, that our properties are also not causing any issues or concerns for them. Um, we work with them regularly and receive calls almost daily. And we'll continue to do that especially as we look at opening things up. Um, next, uh, Deputy, De Kleiner, Deputy Director Kleiner mentioned closing offices. Uh, so I won't cover that again, except to say, we are very fortunate to have rolled out last year an electronic licensing system that allows for print at home options um, and also uh, electronic versions um, on your phone, because without that, we would be probably in a mailing situation right now, which would be very problematic. Again, I wanna thank our hunters, anglers, and constituents for their patience with that. Uh, licensing is doing a great job working through folks um, as we're ramping up more and more people through the electronic version of licenses versus the paper version of licenses. 
Uh, again, I'll mention uh, this is the time of year where we have two dedicated seasons, uh, spring turkey and spring bear. They are, the seasons are only in April and May. So it became apparent very quickly uh, we needed to give people more time to consider whether they could take part of that opportunity, especially with site closures going on. Um, and so by temporary rule, which you'll see, we extended the spring bear tag deadline. You're typically required to have your tag before the season starts. Um, by extending that deadline, it allowed people to really look at where closures are, where they were planned to go, what the stay at home safe lives order meant, um, and modify their plans if they needed to. This is also the time of year where we're checking in cougar and bear that have been harvested. Uh, we also see a lot of ungulates harvested through the road kill salvage permit that is an allowance. Um, this is a requirement um, that we had to change in rule. So now we are allowing people to call our, our biologist and forego the direct contact of checking those animals in. Um, hopefully at some point we'll be able to suspend that and get back to business. I know the roadkill salvage in particular provides us an opportunity for disease testing. We'd like to get back to that soon, but of course safety is of the utmost concern right now. Um, as we watch things roll out, all four of our border states have at least contemplated or gone through closing hunting and angling seasons. Um, we have closed the Columbia salmon and steelhead fishing in response to Washington closing all of their angling seasons. Um, outside of that, for, for a good period, all hunting and angling, clamming and crabbing remained open in Oregon and still does. Um, but I'll talk about how that changed here in a minute. And then of course, we're really trying to avoid openers and closures right now and bottlenecking people into certain locations. Uh, trout stocking, uh, major activity this spring. Um, people do tend to show up when those trucks stock those fish. So we have removed the schedule. Um, we've also removed the online recreational report um, with updates that spread across the straight state. And I'll talk about why that is here in a second. Um, and then last and probably the most significant um, change to our business operations has been the temporary rule that you'll see here in a bit um, that closes seasons for hunting, fishing, shellfish participation by nine non-residents. Um, and I'll, I'll mention to you outfitters and guides in our state, we've also, you'll see a temporary rule for them. Many of their clients are non-residents. So we wanted to give them more time to consider what their plans were gonna be this fall, um, given the level of uncertainty. So we've extended those um, tags for outfitters and guides as well. Moving on to the next slide. So we've had a lot of questions about what is the guidance for wildlife viewers, hunters, anglers, people wanting to go shed hunt, people wanting to get outside and enjoy. Um, and the stay at home, stay lives order is compatible with recreation. Um, there is a lot of simple recommendations that have been made by the Oregon Outdoor Alliance, um, our federal partners and us, and we're all pretty consistent in the messaging that, me that this means we still are maintaining social distancing when we're outdoors. While we're not trapped in a grocery store or a pharmacy, we need to lay, we need to be six feet away and we need to consider travel when we're doing this. Um, this was something we had to do with our own staff. How do we get people to a location coming in from different households? Um, and so I've heard that a lot of people are traveling single in vehicle or staying within their family in units and vehicles. That includes boats, uh, traveling up and down river in boats. The recommendation is that you are with your family unit and that you aren't, um, getting real close with people outside your household. Only go out if you're feeling well. Um, this is this has been stated all along. Of course, we've now seen that COVID-19, many people can be asymptomatic, um, but this definitely applies. If you're feeling under the weather, tired, fatigued at all, it's, it's a good day to stay in. Um, of course, minimize your travel um, to your location. Um, and we keep champion the cause of stay local. There's a lot of opportunities for people in their immediate area and they should be researching those and taking advantage of them. We also recommend people research what is open and closed before they go out. The Oregon State Marine Board has a great resource on boat ramps and who owns them. People can go there um, and see what's open and available. We have been posting on myodfnw.com closures that um, we've done or that we know about. So that's another resources people can 
people can go to. BLM and US Forest Service um, are also posting their closures and restrictions for trailheads. So we just ask that people check those. Um, and overall, it, it's tough. It's tough to be on lockdown for six weeks or more. Um, so we want people to go out and recreate. We want them to do it safely. We want everyone to stay healthy. We're doing a good job flattening the curve. We do not want to see that change. I um, mean, we want to keep these opportunities available. So if you slip, next slide. I'll just say, um, oh, well, I'll reiterate, Chair Walls, thank you to our staff. Um, it's a difficult time for everyone. We very much appreciate the Oregonians who are staying home, who are staying local. Um, we definitely appreciate law enforcement, first responders, our healthcare workers, the people stocking grocery stores. But specific to our department staff, we still have um, folks going out there, getting up 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to go do sage grouse legs, um, checking in wildlife, dealing with damage and nuisance animals, um, going out and interacting with the public to see what has been harvested and monitoring these situations. And so far, what we have seen is a great level of compliance by Oregonians. So we want to pass on that appreciation. Thanks to our staff and their continued work and really we're doing well, we need to can keep doing well, and we're all gonna get through this together. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you both. Um, questions from the commissioners, and I'll just ask the commissioners, I'll go down the line so you have a chance so you don't have to raise your hand right this minute. Greg Woolley, Commissioner Woolley, any questions? I'll take that as a point. Oh, yeah. um, no, I'm just scrolling. No, uh, no questions. Um, thank you, Deputy Directors, for your presentation. Re very thorough. And um, I just echo your appreciation to our staff and all the public that are cooperating so well. Thank you, Greg. Commissioner Labhart. Thanks, Chair Walt. Um, yeah, I'd just like to also uh, ditto what uh, Commissioner Woolley said, but also want to uh, single out the director. I know he's had some tough decisions to make uh, with his leadership staff uh, recently and involvement with the governor's office and coordinating with other agencies and some of these really tough decisions that he's had to make in a short period of time. And I know it's been probably pretty stressful on him. So I want to recognize his efforts to uh, try to find the compromise and still uh, comply with the governor's orders. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, I, I'm very impressed with all the measures that have been taken by ODFW and it's obviously really, really hard um, for everybody. And I just really appreciate what your leadership has done, Kurt, as well as Shannon and Erica in getting everything uh, lined up so people are safe but can still continue their jobs as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Um, I just want to say thank you to, to staff and um, uh, and everyone for the hard work they've been doing. And also thanks for the appropriate ways where people still can get outdoors um, and be safe, because I think that's important. Thank you, Commissioner Spellbrink. Yeah, just to echo those same uh, sentiments, I think the department's done a great job. And <clears throat> this time of year, I, I get input from a lot of, you know, recreational fishermen and stuff. And I think everybody really appreciates the department. Uh, I've heard, I have heard no negative response really. And, and just everybody really appreciative of the way the department's uh, gone to bat for the fishermen and hunters and recreators out there. And, and uh, I think uh, Oregonians really appreciate it. Uh, and I, I really good job. Thank you. Let's move then to the next item. Kurt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Wall, and uh, thanks. Thanks for the thanks, but uh, I think uh, you know it's it's uh, it's a reflection on the uh, 1,200 uh, professional staff that you have here at the department, and 
uh, all the work that they've been doing over the last four weeks. So I really appreciate that. Next up on the agenda then would be an expenditure report from Erica Kleiner, as well as um, a uh, discussion of our agency legislative concepts and our external budget advisory uh, committee work. So I'm not sure which of those is first. I think it might be the expenditure report. There we go. All right. Good morning, Chair Wall and Commissioners. Again, I'm Erica Kleiner, Deputy Director for Administration. Appreciate the opportunity to check in uh, today. Uh, Kristen, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna focus um, my comments today on uh, revenue. Um, I'll touch on the expenditure side as well, um, but I specifically wanna address um, some trends we're seeing with revenue um, for which the primary driver seems to be COVID-19. Um, so you have financial information through the end of the month of February in your written materials. So revenue, particularly revenue from license sales, um, started off very strong early this year. So January, February, um, we saw a more than 50% increases year over year. So 2020 compared to 2019. Um, however, um, we have some concerning preliminary license data trends for March and April. Um, so some deceleration is uh, trending, um, again, driven by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, particularly related to restrictions on travel um, guidance to Oregonians um, and folks in other states to stay home um, and uh, land closures. So looking at the 30 day period um, between mid March and mid April, um, we're down over 12% overall for license sales, which isn't hugely concerning, um, but we see more of an impact to non resident license sales. So the, those are down around 20%, whereas our resident sales are holding steady, um, not quite 10% decline. Um, we're seeing, again, things improve a little bit um, as we um, go into the later part of April, specifically for resident folks who are still buying annual licenses. So we'll continue to watch this very closely. Um, we are a bit concerned with our other fund sources. So federal funds, just a whole lot of uncertainty um, with general fund with not as many Oregonians working and um, a huge impact to our social services provided by the state. We are concerned about the longer term impact with general fund. Um, for a lottery fund, um, it's pretty dire at this point. Um, so we're at about or expecting a 60% reduction um, from the expected lottery fund levels. And um, as many of you know, um, those funds uh, support many of our fish programs uh, with over $6 million in lottery funds. So again, we're watching this, um, just wanted to kind of plant the seed. And um, we have taken a very proactive approach here at ODFW to slow our spending and to do it early. Um, so we have implemented a hiring freeze, and that is all positions and all fund types. Um, and then we've directed um, our managers to really look for opportunities to slow spending. Um, the COVID-19 situation already has an impact on our spending in that um, we're not traveling as much, um, we're not buying as much. Um, so those things do help us naturally reduce spending, but we have our managers taking this very seriously and again, trying to slow spending so that any future gap we have isn't quite as large. And then again, we'll just continue to watch revenue very closely and make adjustments as we go. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Brandy Nichols, our, economic, our budget and economic services manager, will talk a little bit about the EVAC process. But I did want to um, hit on budget development in general. We are making significant progress on our agency request budget for 2021-23. Um, budget uh, deadlines, process deadlines have not changed. And so we are staying on track with it, this process and getting creative with stakeholder um, engagement. Uh, we are preparing approximately 20 policy option packages um, for your consideration and approval in June. Um, about half of these packages are continuation pops. So that just means that we have these existing programs, we have the funding, the staff, 
and we're just planning to go to the legislature to ask that we continue that into um, the future biennium. Um, about half of the POPs um, are for um, new funding, new position authority. Um, in most cases, it's other funds or federal funds, but um, a few exceptions for general fund requests. Um, we will pay very close attention to our economic climate and also direction from um, Department of Administrative Services and Governor's Office on um, what the availability of general fund will be. So um, we could um, kind of pivot and adjust those to some extent um, as we come into um, submission of the ARB. Um, next slide, please, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to touch on just a few audit updates. Um, the first is the Title VI audit. Um, this was the audit on ADA and um, compliance issues. Um, auditors came out to um, a few different sites, um, E.E. E. Wilson, Savi Island, Lad Marsh, um, and looked at the accessibility of our services. And so they did have um, several recommendations where we can improve or improve. Those were mostly focused on program administration and field location compliance. So improvements to our signage, parking, hand railings, um, uneven, uneven pavement, things like that. Um, so managers are working with our internal audit to respond to those recommendations. Uh, Secretary of State audit, um, this was more of a review. Um, Secretary of State's office came in and looked um, way in the past and they looked at um, uh, past audits that we've had and if we fully implemented those historical recommendations and um, we came back in a compliance um, in all cases. So that was very good. And then finally, the Oregon State Police Audit, um, they looked at our administration of the law enforcement data system. And the outcome was that our management practices do align with um, statutory requirements and with Oregon State Police expectations. So we are good with that one as well. Um, Kristen, next slide, please. Thank you. So I will hand it off to Brandy Nichols to cover changes to our EVAC process. Okay, okay good, morning. good morning, Hunter Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Um, for the record, I'm Brandy Nichols, Budget and Economic Services Manager. So due to health concerns around COVID-19 and to be in compliance with the governor's executive order, we did not hold the in-person EVAC meeting this year in March. Of course, we wanted an alternative to still meaningfully engage with our EVAC members as part of our budget development process. Um, so what we did is we um, set up an online comments forum for our EVAC members to be able to share with us their advice, recommendations, and input um, on budget de development for the coming biennium. So the EBAC presentation materials were posted to the ODFW website on April 7th, including the presentation slides that would have been discussed during this March meeting. Uh, before we posted those slides, um, we thought about the um, different style of this being a remote presentation. And um, we recognized this was different and we wanted to make our EBAC members feel as connected as possible with us through this presentation. So we added some notes and um, additional detail to those slides to make them more readable um, for EVAC members going through that on their own and to give the slides more of um, the feeling of having a conversation. Um, we also indicated a contact person um, on each side for our EVAC members to reach out to um, if they came up with any questions on that site's particular content. So also on April 7th, our EVAC members received an email with a link to access these presentation materials and a link to and instructions for how to use um, the online comments form. Um, Kristen, next slide, please. So uh, the presentation slides include a great deal of information on various topics around um, our budget development, including division updates, uh, revenue trends and fund balance projections, legislation legislative concepts and um, initial policy option package concepts. So we designed um, the online comments form to be set up in sections um, to allow our EBAC members to provide feedback on as many or as few uh, topic sections as they would like. Um, another thing we did to help um, make this process a little easier and user friendly for our EBAC members is we made the presentation slides available um, through a link within this online comments form. 
And here we actually took those presentation slides. I believe there's about 93 or 94 of them. We took those slides and divided them into sections to correspond with the sections of the comments form. Um, so that EBEC members would have the relevant slides handy um, for them to review and work with as they're working to provide feedback. So this online comments form is open for our EBEC members through um, Sunday, April 26th. So following this, um, we will take comments and questions received um, and compile those along with um, our responses into a summary document. Our plan is to post this summary document to the ODFW webpage and also email it out to our EBAC members. Um, we have this in mind to likely take the place of the typical um, second EBAC meeting that um, is held in May, which is where in a normal year, a normal situation, we would acknowledge feedback that was provided and follow up on any questions that we would have received from the first meeting. Um, next slide, please. So um, these are certainly unprecedented times um, that we are all working through. Um, uh, both the earlier presentations, you know, mentioned that, and I know we all know that just from um, from what we've worked through. So, um, in light of this, or in spite of this, we really look forward to how um, this alternative process that we set up still allows for engagement with our EBAC members and provides them a good opportunity to share thoughtful perspective and feedback um, with us as an important part of our budget development. Um, next slide, please. And at this point, um, we will pause for any questions you may have on our updated EBAC process or on the update that Deputy Director Kleiner shared. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to ask a couple questions and then I'll go through the list again for commissioners. The first one is for you, Erica. What are you hearing on federal funding? We have um, to allow for uh, Brandy to not get some feedback. So, do you mind repeating? Hey, uh, Chair Wall, this is Kurt Melcher, and, and uh, I can answer that question. The question was um, as long as you all can pick me up, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. But uh, the question was, what, we are what are we expecting on federal funds? Yes. And I think um, on federal funds, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, we know, for instance, um, that our sport fish restoration funds, which uh, come from the excise tax on, on uh, fishing tackle, uh, we know that those, were, uh, those projections were down or decreased slightly from 2019. And we expect with the continued reduction in recreational fishing activity that those will, those projections will probably continue to ten, uh, trend downward as we move through 2020. Um, many of our federal funds, our grant funds have been flat funded for several years and flat funding uh, presents its own challenges as it relates to our increasing costs. So uh, things like our, uh, uh, the work we do for Bonneville Power Administration continue to have the flat funding pressures, but we're not expecting any major declines in that. And then uh, uh, on the, the Pittman-Robertson side, which is the uh, federal excise tax on arms and ammunition that comes to us for wildlife programs, uh, what we're seeing or what we're hearing right now is that uh, those funds are likely to be um, uh, some pretty dramatically increased in uh, 2020 as there's been a lot of activity in the arms and uh, ammunition industry of late. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Chair Wall, can I, can I just add to that? I'm sorry, we had our first technical difficulty. We had speakers turned off, so Brandy didn't get feedback. So I apologize for that. Um, but I will just add to what Director Melcher said. Um, we are tracking expenditures to submit for federal reimbursement opportunities. Um, so we're not only tracking our direct costs related to COVID-19, but we're tracking our in relation to costs. Um, so we do expect to um, submit, and we're doing that um, actually weekly from our accounting folks um, for federal reimbursement. Thank you. That's helpful. 
Commissioners, um, Commissioner Woolley. Um, thank you, Chair Wall. So uh, Deputy Director Kleiner and Director Melcher, just wondering in light of COVID-19 uh, with the legislature across the board, not just with our agency, but just the general climate, are you feeling kind of more of an air of con conservatism or caution um, in terms of funding discussions, you know, irrespective of the sources of funding, but just um, how the legislature is feeling right now. Do, do you have any sense of that? Uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Woolley, um, certainly um, that's been the direction given um, by Department of Administrative Services um, so far is that given the um, uncertainty involved that we should proceed very cautiously. They haven't actually um, changed direction for um, agencies to kind of regroup on uh, budget asks, but um, that very well could come in the future. Um, but certainly we've been told to look at opportunities within our agencies to reduce uh, funding and just better position ourselves for what is expected to come. Thank you. And Dr. Melcher, did you want to add anything to that or, or no? Uh, <clears throat> no, I would just uh, agree wholeheartedly. And of course, the next um, state revenue forecast does not come out until uh, May 20th. So we won't have any official new revenue forecasts on the state general fund side until May 20th. But uh, all, uh, I mean, it, it, all, all indications, and you all know this, are that uh, state general fund revenue is going to uh, be down dramatically um, beginning around the middle of March or third week of March. So, um, so we're preparing. I guess I would just add um, a couple, a couple additional points that are related, and that is, uh, Erica mentioned that we have implemented an agency-wide all fund type hiring freeze. And uh, we did that for two, two reasons. Of course, one to uh, start uh, cost containment, but also, you know, we have a, a really strong obligation to our staff. And if there are um, pending uh, dramatic reductions in some revenue, uh, we want to, we want to be able to have, uh, or at least maximize the probability that we have landing spots for employees that uh, that may be in positions that aren't funded in the future. So it's uh, it's really not just about cost containment. It's also out of a um, out of looking out for the interest of our of our employees. Thank you. Um, why don't we go to Commissioner Labhart and then um, Commissioner Zonowitz. Hey, thank you, Chair. Well, I have um, essentially three questions and I'm not sure who would answer these, but have we heard anything more on Renewable for America's Wildlife Act at the federal level? Is, um, is it going to be up for a vote or is it postponed? What's the status on that? Second question is, is that you know, given the situation with the current biennium and the potential huge drop in revenue for both general fund and some dedicated funds, including lottery, um, are we being instructed at the governor's office level to reduce the amount of POP requests at this time? That's the second question. And then the third question is, uh, given the uh, POP requests, I think I've seen uh, several, but um, I understand there's a, a number of POP requests. Is the EBAC going to see those POP requests in the next round of uh, input? Thanks. Well, this is Kurt Melcher, uh, Chair Wall, and Commissioner Labhart. The, um, I guess I'll take those in reverse order. And absolutely, uh, the EBAC does uh, and will see, if they have not already, our list of policy option packages. And I'll let uh, Erica or Brandy chime in here at any point if they want to add information. Um, on the second question about um, direction from the governor's office on policy option packages, uh, we have not received any um, change in our budget development instructions from the governor's office. However, uh, I think it's entirely reasonable to expect that there could be some change in those directions. So 
we're standing by. We're proceeding with developing policy option packages, and uh, we'll see we'll see what that direction is um, in the future. And then the first question that you had on the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, uh, that is, of course, uh, it passed out of a House committee, um, I believe, in January. Uh, it has not been voted on on the full House floor yet. Uh, as you know, they're, they've been uh, distracted here and working on the, uh, a series of stimulus bills related to the, the nation's economy. Um, I know there are folks that are advocating, uh, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and others, that are advocating for that to be included in a future uh, stimulus bill. Um, I don't know what the how I don't know what the prospects of that actually happening are, but there are folks advocating for that. Thank you, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Wall. Um, I don't have, uh, I think Mark asked some of the questions I would have had. I've also been, since I'm on the EBAC, I'm reviewing the uh, docu, I've reviewed the presentation, which I thought was very thorough and I was amazed how long it was. <laughs> but um, it did go through a lot of details. And then um, I have yet to actually go through the budget document that you have, but I'm gonna do that this weekend. So that's all I have. Thank you. And I'll go to the other two commissioners for questions, but I would like to mention one thing that Commissioner Zarnowitz brought up, and that is that the EBAC did put out the 93 slide presentation about the budget for EBAC, but it's something that if the commissioners haven't looked, it is posted and commissioners, if you can look through that, that's important stuff, especially as a run up to the June meeting when we'll really have to be spending some serious time on budget issues. So that's one piece to look at. So is the white paper that the, the department has posted now. And I think we're gonna hear in a few minutes about the, the POPs, the policy option packages from Deputy Director Hearn. So we can save our questions on those till then, including the priority and what we're focusing on um, but I do urge you to take a look at those presentations that have already been posted um, if you haven't had a chance to yet. So Commissioner Spellbrink, do you have questions on the budget information we've heard so far? No, no questions. I think they've all been answered anyway. Thank you, Commissioner Hatfield-Hyde. She's finished. Then let's move on to the next one, which is Deputy Director Hearn talking about the the, the legislative concepts, including the policy option packages. I have a good point. Um, while today we're not presenting on the policy option packages um, that are in those EBAC materials, the idea here and the strategy always is that that we as a department prepare those. We post those for the public. Um, we'll take those out to the EBAC, but we'll also take those out in some form, typically town halls, although as Brandy described, that's that won't be the norm now. We solicit a bunch of feedback and we have one-on-one -on -one com um, conversations with commissioners. And then we take all that feedback and we present it to you in June. So I, I'm not gonna go over policy option packages. Um, but if you, you have specific questions now, I only have two or three slides and then we can get to those. Digging into the legislative concepts, uh, it works very similar to preparing a budget. Uh, so for reference, I wanna let everyone know, um, I'm the agency's coordinator, uh, agency's legislative coordinator. Um, and in long sessions, executive agencies can request that budgets be, or budgets, man, bills be introduced on their behalf. Um, and so the timeline for this is the, the spring of the following year in April, you submit legislative concepts, you submit those to DAS. Um, DAS works with you a little bit on understanding um, what the problem is that you're trying to resolve and to flesh that out. Um, and then you at some point before late summer meet with the governor's office and you again describe the problem that you're trying to solve. And once they've been vetted through DAS and the governor's office, 
Um, they will be submitted to legislative council to draft those problem statements into an actual bill that fixes it by statute. Um, we will see those typically once after they're done drafting then um, in the fall. We get one chance to make any corrections. Um, and if they get vetted all through that process, they will be introduced um, late, late December, early January, depending on when they really kick off session. And that's when the public process begins for legislative concepts. Um, commissioners, you all have, have seen this process before. Um, you know, it's up to the agency to work to get those bills scheduled for hearings, um, provide any information needed um, to answer questions, and then hopefully they get voted on the floor, um, passed out of the legislature, and then signed by the governor. So we're looking ahead, next slide, um, to the legislative concepts for 2021. Um, we have three concepts that have been tried in the past um, out of the six or seven total, and I'll tell you why it's six or seven here in a second. Um, so the leftover ones from previous sessions um, is in 2019, technically one we tried in 2019. Um, we have talked to hunters and anglers at town halls and EBACs, uh, EBAC and other public meetings about our fee increase. Um, majority of folks have supported maintaining programs and rolling those fee increases out as the legislature approved them. There was one exception to that, and that was really looking at daily angling licenses and people um, entering into the opportunity to, to fish in our state and give it a try on a day and also to shellfish. And where this comes most into play is through the charter industry. Um, they're trying to remain competitive with other states um, and keep their costs down to customers. And so through conversations with them, we've decided um, to suggest that maybe we decrease the cost of the daily angling and shellfish license from $32.50 to the cost of simply the daily, which would be $23. So that's a, sub, a, a substantial reduction. Most of it would be taken in the, in the shellfish program, which is absorbable. Um, and we think that would be good uh, for the charters and our customers as well. And then in addition to that, since we have the statute open up that, that deals with fees, we would also like to add the language um, through a legislative concept and bill that, that prescribes that we may charge up to the fee amount so the legislature approves those fee amounts. They would essentially be setting caps if we were able to do this. And then we could run promotions and discounts um, at certain times of the year uh, for recruitment, reactivation and retention purposes. So that's legislative uh, concept number one. The next one was also introduced in 2019. Uh, it was a package bill with restoration and enhancement program. Um, fixes. This part of the bill did not pass, and that was to maintain the Columbia River endorsement fee. Um, I won't get into the policy around Columbia River reform. Uh, needless to say, that is the big part of this conversation, but when we look at the 10 years that that endorsement fee has been out there, it sunsets at the end of 22, and the package around Columbia River reform is built on that funding for production, monitoring, enforcement, and so we want to extend or remove that sunset date. That's legislative concept number two. Um, and then the last one on this slide is a bill that was run in 2020 session. Representative Bretto ran this bill. Um, it was working with partners on the Oregon SageCon who have developed a, a way to calculate the impacts from development on sage grouse and develop a payment in lieu program for mitigation. So. This legislative concept would set up that fund um, and it would allow for investment in longer term pools. We call them intermediate term pool. Uh, we would still seek permission from the state treasury. If successful as a bill, this would allow um, investment in that longer term pool, which actually reduced the mitigation costs over the lifespan of the project, which, which helps um, us actually discuss this with developers um, and determine with them which mitigation pathway they're gonna take. Traditional, which is on the ground mitigation or maybe a payment and move fund. So that's the first three, next slide. The next three are new concepts for 2021 that we have not tried to run in the past. Um, 
our landowner preference tag program also sunsets at the end of 2021. Um, so we'll ask for a removal of this sunset. That's a negotiated agreement between the department, hunters and landowners. Um, based on acreage, there are tags available um, to landowners. Uh, it's in recognition of the habitat they provide um, the access um, that we would like to see for hunters on their property. And the, there, there will be a conversation of this. The last time this was done, um, I think it was about 10 years ago, it started another work group to look at this, this issue. We'll see if that come, comes about. I know there's some interest, especially on the hunting side in discussing this more thoroughly. Um, that can all take place between now and the time that bill is introduced, and then a lot more in depthly once that bill is introduced. Uh, moving on, we also have identified that um, we have a state wildlife fund that it might be beneficial to invest in longer term pools as well. This kind of mirrors on the greater sage grouse fund that we would do again with permission from state treasury, we could take some of this ending balance um, and potentially invest it in different term pools. And then the last legislative concept that we are submitting today, because today is the deadline, um, we have an interagency work group working on this concept of premium fishing opportunities. Um, as you know, angling um, is run a lot different than hunting um, within our state. And so angling is a lot of general um, buy a tag over the counter, um, you decide which fish species you want to go to, then there's some tags that basically would limit you if you if you were a really successful ang angler, but for most species there is there is really no cap. Um, and so there are fish populations out there that we don't allow harvest of because there's no really way to monitor um, that harvest level. And so we're calling this kind of a limited entry new opportunity. And that work group is looking specifically at, um, at recommendations they would make for specific fish populations. We do not have those recommendations yet. That's why this will be submitted as a placeholder. The hope is that team is done working um, right around June when I would have to update this um, to fully submit it to DAS to get it to move forward. And we would bring back more information on that to you guys in June. So next slide. That is all we have for this part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Director. Director. Um, are there questions from the commissioners? And we'll start at the other end this time, um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. No, Commissioner Spellbrink. No, I don't have any questions. I think we did talk about that, uh, about the uh, maybe down the road for some of the uh, premium, you know, apply for basically a fish tag. Like I think we were talking about Willamette River sturgeon, which is, you know, such a small uh, uh, catch available there that it's hard to manage and things like that. But I think it's a good idea. Commissioner Zarnowitz or Commissioner Labhart. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, no questions, just comments. Uh, we live in interesting times, and I think this next legislative session, 2123, is going to probably be one of the most interesting legislative sessions we've we've been through in a long, long time. So it's going to be uh, pretty interesting to watch this process move along, and I think things are going to be quite fluid, clear to the end. Thank you, Commissioner Woolley. Questions? Yeah, just uh, one question. So regarding the Columbia River endorsement, the carryover uh, that's uh, scheduled to sunset 2022, are we, are we requesting a specific new end date or along with that extension? That's it. Well, this is, uh, this is Kurt Melcher, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Woolley. I, uh, when we ran this bill in the 2019 session, we uh, did not have an end date. We wanted the sunset just simply removed. Uh, from our perspective, the Columbia River fishing reform is a, is a, it's a permanent rule. It's a permanent package and therefore the the endorsement that supports that program should also be permanent. 
Um, as I think as Shannon mentioned, we were unsuccessful in uh, getting that sunset removed in the last session. So our at least having not talked strategically to anyone about this, my starting point would be again to just simply remove the sunset. Thank you. I have a, a question and then a couple of comments. The first one is a question. Um, Deputy Director Hearn, could you talk about the focus for the policy option packages? And I know you didn't go over them, but could you talk about what the focus will be from the department with those? So, Chair Wall, excellent question. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, we, before COVID 19 situation arise, we had a moderate um, POP request. Of course, that's um, subjective, but in, in our view, a moderate POP request. And uh, mainly because that focused on um, what we re received in our 2019 budget was a request to look at standing up a habitat division. Um, as you know, our wildlife policy requires us to manage fish and wildlife and their habitat um, for future use and enjoyment. And so we have uh, undergone that exercise um, and, our, and that is part of our EBAC materials to describe that habitat division. So most of the POPs are focused on that. Um, in addition to that, there's always typically what we call continuation POPs. Um, and that's POPs that we have asked for in the past or have become part of our budget that we are required to um, continue through two and a half biennium to request until they become permanent. Um, and then we have four or five POPs outside of that habitat division that are really um, focused efforts that we've been working on with the governor's office or other partners. And so that's, that's kind of a very general picture without getting into each individual POP. Um, let me know if you want more information on any of that. Thank you, that's good for now. And that helps, thank you. Um, my comments are on two different pieces of our budget and budget presentation and our legislative pieces. The premium fishing one seems to me to be one of those places where we have a terrific chance to go talk to the, to the entire state. And it would be important to do that on something like a premium fishing item. Um, it's a chance to engage people um, if we're looking at at switching how we're addressing those. And I think it's important to do what you talked about, which is to be careful how we manage small populations. But if we're also talking about then some sort of a premium fishing on those like Willamette sturgeon, it seems like there is, you know, in the in the recent poll that we heard that, that covered the whole state, there's a lot of the state that's very interested um, in the, the whole, um, habitat, outside, rec, you know, outdoor recreation, all of those pieces and not necessarily just focused on hunting and fishing, but a broad scope and the ecosystem services and just the, that those species exist. And if we could be talking with them, this is a chance to do it. And I think that would be worth pursuing. The other one is sort of along those same lines in the white paper that we have already out. And again, I do urge the commissioners to look at these because there's a lot of great information in those, in the budget white paper and in the EBAC materials. Um, the piece that I, I would urge us to make sure we're taking is that role that helps the public understand the where climate change issues fit with the department because the department's taken some leadership positions on that in among state agencies in the habitat division and what it can do and in the conservation strategy it seems like those are great opportunities to engage a broad swath of the of the state that that we haven't necessarily spent as much time with so those are just comments and I think we have documents that are going out broadly and it would be a great chance to kind of highlight what we're doing on those areas. Um, so that's it on my comments and questions and it looks like all the commissioners are fine too. So you look like you're about to say something, Director Melcher. Wow, good read. <laughs> good read from uh, 300 miles away. Uh, I was going to say something, and what I wanted to say was, um, and, and we can certainly uh, distribute the pull the pop list and uh, distribute it directly to all six of you commissioners, um, if that makes it easier than going through the, the EBAC materials, we're, we're happy to do that. But what I was going to say is there's, you know, there's some um, two 
two things that are not on that list of legislative concepts that I wanted to note for you. Uh, the first one is that we are talking about potentially um, extending or eliminating the sunset on the Oregon Conservation and Recreation uh, Fund legislation. And uh, not sure yet whether that will be an agency proposal or if it's better coming from uh, some of the original bill proponents. So we will be working on that. Um, either directly or, or indirectly. But then the one that I really wanted to note for you all that is not on that list that you do not see, um, and uh, that is any uh, legislative concept or placeholder legislative concept related to increasing our fees, uh, with the exception of extending the Columbia Basin endorsement. There's no legislative concept for increasing our fees. Uh, we, of course, uh, in the 2015 legislative session, we implemented a fee increase, which was structured over um, a six year period. Uh, that increase was designed to get us through uh, the calendar year 2021. Um, we've, as you all know, been doing an excellent job in managing our finances, both on the recreational fishing um, fee side, but also on the commercial fish fund side. And so we, uh, we're gonna make it um, beyond our original six year uh, fee schedule without raising fees. So you don't see that on the list and that is why. And that and was all I wanted to say. Thank you, that's an, that's an important one and worth worth bringing up definitely for all of you it's 10 15 let's take a 10 minute break and Kristen can you remind us what we need to do to make sure we all get right back on here yeah absolutely so you'll want to mute your microphones and stop your video during the break so those icons can be found on the bottom left hand corner of your um, screen and we'll just return back um, in the, that amount of time, and you can unmute and start your video at that time. Thank you. So please be back at 10, 10 25.
So it's 1025. Maybe we'll just give people one more minute to get back and then we'll start with Chris Kern's report on the salmon stock status. There he is. Okay. It's all yours, Chris. Okay, thank you. Is the audio okay? Yes. Okay. I'll wait for Kristen a little bit. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Wall, um, Commissioners, Director Melcher, and whoever uh, from the public we may have listening. Uh, for the record, Chris Kern, Deputy Administrator for the Fish Division. Um, and I'm here to go over a little bit of uh, some information on salmon stock status for this year uh, forecast, as well as some historic context to kind of give you a sense of where those lie in the, in the grander scheme. Uh, Chris, if you go ahead to the next. So just a little bit of background first, and then I'll go through um, the context I've sort of prepared for you is last year's returns, this year's forecasts, and also uh, uh, some illustrations of historical returns for some key stocks. Uh, go ahead for the next slide, please. And that's just a blank, so one more. Okay. Um, you don't have to focus too much on the on the details of this figure. There's There's quite a bit in it. I wanted to give you a little bit of a sort of more ecological background because the ocean conditions um, often drive a lot of what we see in salmon populations. Um, the population dynamics as well as the ocean ecology are, are very complex and we don't have time to go in too, too deep into either of those. Uh, also, I'm, I'm not an oceanographer. Uh, this is all real high level stuff, but I think as, as we walk through the remainder of these slides, I thought it was helpful to sort of point out that when we talk about salmon in Oregon and the Northwest, uh, we're really not just talking about one ocean ecosystem. There are several um, sort of independent areas and they can track together or not. Uh, and some of our fish spend time in, in multiple of those. So um, this one illustrates some of the currents uh, uh, coming towards the coast of North America. So in particular, near the middle of the North Pacific current. And as that approaches the continent, it splits off. Uh, to one going south, one going north. And so the one, um, and it actually splits fairly close to Oregon or, or um, sometimes up to Vancouver Island, it moves around as I understand it. But um, so we end up with what we call the California current going south and the more um, northerly Alaska current going north. Um, the California core current is sort of right outside our front door. And so a lot of our fish go through that uh, ecosystem, but uh, uh, many of them also migrate into the Alaska current as well. So um, not going to go into any more detail on those two aspects, um, other than the, later on I'll point out where some of our fish tend to go, but I wanted to give you a little context on that. So um, next slide, please. And the first thing I need to say on this slide is don't try to read everything on it. It's not intended for you to try and capture all the details. If you are interested, the link down there at the bottom will take you to this table and give you some more of the background information on it. Some of you may have seen it before. We, we tend to call it the red light, green light table um, and uh, it's a really useful data set just for context even if its format isn't very friendly for those who have trouble with red and green colors um, but um, this reflects a set of coastal survey data off the coast of Oregon and Washington and it's it is in sort of the northern part of the California current there's a number of sampling uh, transects it was initiated by Dr. Bill Peterson at NOAA's Newport lab in the, in the late 90s um, unfortunately, we don't have data going back into the last, um, one of the earlier periods of significant decline we saw in a lot of our stocks in the mid 90s because the survey wasn't done yet. Um, the thing to really focus on here is these are a number of metrics. They're all um, relevant in some fashion to salmonid life history and ecology. Um, and a red value simply means it's uh, below average uh, green above and, and yellow is sort of in the middle. So the visual picture you get is just, if there's a lot of red, that tends to be bad for salmon. And if there's a lot of green, it tends to be good and yellow is kind of neutral. And so you see some blocks of time where you have relatively consistent patterns um, for several years and then a change to another set of patterns. And, and that follows some of the trends you see with things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and other parameters as well. So this isn't new. Um, the patterns aren't new. Obviously, climate change has effects on these things and will continue to do so. But you, in general, you do send, tend to see trends grouped together without short-term flips back and forth with a few exceptions. You'll note one 
kind of right in the middle of the most recent good period. There was a, a short window there where it sort of flipped to fairly negative conditions, but then it did flip back. Um, we've been in a block of pretty poor conditions lately. We've got a few highlights uh, the last couple of years that are hopefully indicative of some change coming. Um, but uh, again, uh, just sort of a broad picture. Um, this stuff is relevant to, because it helps explain some of what's going on in our populations, um, and we have used it before for that purpose. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to generally start in the south and work our way north to the Columbia. Um, I wanted to hit some of the southern stocks. Um, these are fish that, uh, for the Chinook stocks anyway, that tend to be a little more oriented to the California current and not so much the far north. Um, and so they're generally living in that California current ecosystem for their for their full lifespan, whereas a lot of our other fish transition into the Alaska current. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so before we start looking at the numbers, I want to orient you a little bit to this slide format because it, it's going to carry through through the rest of the presentation. So what I've got here, and hopefully you can see them well enough. You also should have them in your in your packet that was distributed to you. Uh, we've got a figure in the upper right that represents year-on-year -year, uh, escapement, in this case, to the Sacramento River. Um, the blue bars in historic years are the actual returns, and the red indicates forecast. So I've carried that format through for the remainder of the slides, except in a couple of places where there isn't a forecast, but there's still relevant data. And I've also put a small table off the site of most of these, just give you the current forecast as the 2020 number and last year's return. Um, as well as sort of a 10-year average. Um, wasn't intending to spend much time on those tables themselves. They're more for your reference as you look through this, this um, the PowerPoints. Okay, so I'll go to the Sacramento. Um, and Klamath is also on this slide. I put them on the slide together because these are actually large drivers for Oregon's, much of Oregon's ocean salmon fisheries. Uh, in terms of Chinook, most of what we catch off the central Oregon coast and down to the California border are driven by these stocks. Um, you can see in the upper right, Sacramento uh, is a, it can be a very large stock, a very abundant stock in some years. You'll see a peak in um, about 2002 of about 800,000 fish for fall Chinook. They have uh, some other, other seasonal stocks in the Sacramento as well. This is just one of them. Um, but you also see a lot of cycling and you see some pretty low returns in recent years. Last year's return had in, it was improved. We've been seeing a little bit of gradual improvement since uh, the 2016 year. And this year's forecast is for a little bit better than last year uh, at about 220,000 fish, um, which is higher than a 10 year average. But as you look back in the time series, it certainly has produced more than that in the past. Klamath um, River in the lower left has also been at a low abundance lately. Uh, this series is wild fish escapement into the basin. And again, you'll see a lot of variation. You'll also note some cycling of, of sort of ups and downs tend to be followed by each other for a period of time, which again reflects back to that red light, green light chart to some degree. Uh, I'll note that both of these basins are, are highly affected by water issues in the basin. Um, the drought hit California very hard. There's also water management issues in both the Sacramento and Klamath. Um, obviously folks are very familiar with the Klamath in Oregon, um, particularly Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, I'm sure. Um, and so there's a lot of issues there uh, that drive some of that. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned there's some definite ups and down cycles. So next slide, please. Okay, so this one is moving a little further north into Oregon proper. The upper right is Rogue Fall Chinook. These are um, uh, abundance estimates generated by the Huntley Park Saning Program down in the lower Rogue. And you can see that uh, similar to Klamath, which this, Stock tends to track with the Kalamata a bit, although not precisely. Um, their, their distribution patterns and abundance trends tend to be similar. Um, you'll see the downturn as well. Uh, we do have a large forecast, larger forecast improved for this year, and that's reflecting what we saw last year, which was uh, quite a few jacks uh, come back to the robe uh, compared to prior years. So we do think that that abundance is going to be up. The lower left figure is a little bit different kind of data, and you'll note there's no red bar, there's no forecast for that. What this reflects is uh, essentially spawning ground surveys, and I wanted to put this up here because the data goes back a long ways. We do have forecasts for these other uh, non-rogue South Coast Fall Chinook populations, 
Um, but this data set was longer than what I had for those forecasts. So I, I included that. I'll note that the forecasts for these populations are generally pretty similar to last year's in that they are down. But what this data reflects is uh, basically spawners observed per mile of habitat surveyed. Uh, and so it's more of a density index. And I put it up there because again, you can see some ups and downs in, in the sort of trending approach. So this is fish per mile. The 10 year average would be 38 spawners per mile on average across these populations. Last year's return was about 10 per mile, which is significantly down, um, but you'll see that that has happened before as part of the sort of cycling of the population. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now I'm gonna move a little more northward and we're gonna shift from um, populations that, that don't in the south, don't extensively migrate north to some that do. Uh, in particular, our fall Chinook from the mid and north Oregon coast. So basically starting at the Elk River north, we start to move into fish that migrate to the north instead of hanging out in the California current uh, to varying degrees. Now coho, uh, not so much. They, they do migrate northward, but not quite as far as Chinook. So they're a little more affected by the California current. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so again, I'm just moving south to north. The upper right figure is what we call the Mid-Oregon Coast Aggregate. That's a sum of, a, of several populations between the elk uh, and then north up to it, including the Umpqua. Uh, and so these are aggregates of all those returns together. They don't uh, all trend in the same direction every year by any stretch necessarily, but uh, the aggregate is what I'm showing you here just uh, for simplicity and to save some time. This is a, a group of populations that was trending downward over the last few years um, and is forecasted to start returning upwards a little bit um, this year. Again, following some of the trends we've been seeing, uh, this response is not surprising. I'll note that these mid-Oregon coast fish uh, for fall Chinook, they're north migrators. They tend to go all the way up towards Ala uh, into Alaska and Canada, but they do so a little less than the counterparts to the north that I'm gonna talk about next. And so they are encountered at a little bit higher rate in Oregon and Washington uh, salmon fisheries. But the, re the balance, uh, the, the largest share of fishery impact for the mid-Oregon coast fall Chinook and the north Oregon coast that I'll talk about in a minute is actually uh, as far as what occurs in the southern area. So not counting Alaska and Canada, the largest impacts by far in fisheries are in the rivers themselves. Um, ocean fisheries off Oregon and Washington uh, catch them, but at a pretty low rate. Um, I'll move to the North Oregon Coast group. So this is the Sayusla north to the Mechanicum, basically. And these are fish that go a little further north than the Mid-Oregon Coast fish. And they're also encountered at a little bit higher rate in some of those northern fisheries, such as the uh, Southeast Alaska and British Columbia troll fisheries. Um, our encounters off the coast of Oregon and Washington are even lower than they are for the Mid-Oregon Coast. And again, in terms of the Southern US impacts, those occurring in Washington and Oregon areas, the large majority of those are in the rivers themselves, not in the ocean fisheries. Um, a lot of folks aren't, aren't aware of that, um, but that is, that is the case over time, uh, validated by tag recoveries that we do every year. So um, next uh, slide, please. So this one I wanted to show you again because it's a long time series. This is actually the same set of populations as the North Oregon coast fish I showed on the last slide, but it's a different um, metric. This is more like the one for the South Oregon coast that I discussed, which is fish per mile. And the reason I'm showing this is because it goes back to the 60s. Um, we, we fundamentally manage these fish with um, abundance estimates in aggregate nowadays rather than these density measures, but this is this is long-term data that I think is useful. The arrow is pointing to, uh, well, it's a little off, but it's meant to point to 1985. And the reason I'm showing that is that's the year the Pacific Salmon Treaty was signed. Um, and so if you look at sort of before and after that event, you do see increased average returns in this in this set of populations relative to the time frame before. Now, a lot of other things have changed as well besides the treaty, um, but and there are obviously still ups and downs as you can see from the figure. Um, but in average, on average, uh, more fish in these populations than before that treaty was implemented. I thought that might be an interesting piece of information for you. So next slide, please. Okay, shifting a little bit to coho. This is um, spawner estimated spawner abundances of Oregon coast wild coho. 
Um, and these are fish, again, as I said earlier, they tend to remain a little closer to home, relatively speaking anyway, more time in the California current. This is a stock that is listed um, under the ESA as threatened, has been since the 1990s. Um, and working towards recovery for this stock really kind of formed the foundation of the Oregon plan. And um, it's doing far better than it was at the time of listing. Historically, coho fisheries in Oregon and Washington were pretty significant um, prior to the 90s and prior to listing. And at times, the impact rates from all fisheries combined could, could exceed 80%. Um, since implementation of the management framework we've been using um, for the last 10 to 20 years, um, those harvest rates are dramatically reduced, um, fractions of what they used to be. And so today, the main driver of the population is ocean conditions. And again, you do see ups and downs. Uh, I think something that's very important is, is you can see from the mid 2000s, some periods of quite high returns indicating um, some real productivity potential for these populations when conditions are, are improved. Um, coho are generally the first species we see in the salmon family uh, to show a response to changing conditions. So when things become poor, we tend to see it first in the coho. And when things improve, we usually see it in coho first as well. Uh, Chinook tend to respond a little more slowly because of their multiple age class structure, uh, whereas coho come back as jacks or three-year-old adults, and, and that's basically it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the Columbia. Uh, as you're aware, there's a, a lot of different stocks in the Columbia. We're, we don't have time to go through all of them, so I've tried to pull some high-profile ones, ones that we commonly talk about at the commission uh, or of other special concern. These are primarily also north migrating stocks in terms of Chinook. And again, the coho are, are a little bit similar to the Oregon Coast coho in that they're a little, they don't roam quite as far. Uh, and also I'm putting some steelhead information in here as well. Um, next slide, please. So this one's a little busier. I'm trying to capture again, some information together. Uh, the right-hand figure at the upper right shows two stocks, the Willamette River Springs, Spring stock, as well as the upriver Columbia stock. Uh, the blue line above them is basically a sum of all stocks to the river. And so the, basically the difference between those bars tells you there's some small stocks mixed in there as well uh, that occur on an annual basis, contribute to total abundance. But the large majority of the fish returning to the river in the springtime are, are going to be in one of these two groups. The upriver run is comprised of several pieces. Uh, the Snake River component includes the Snake River Spring and Summer Run Chinook and the upper Columbia portion is spring only. Both of those, uh, all three of those units have ESA listed components as does the Willamette. Uh, again, you'll notice ups and downs over time. You may also notice that the Willamette tends to trend a bit with the Columbia. Um, similar to the Rogue and Klamath, they tend to go together but they're not precisely linked in every year, but they do, they do trend in the same way. Um, and so the lighter bars are the upper the run and the darker bar on the bottom is the Willamette. And on the forecast, it's the same. It's a lighter red for the upriver and darker for the Willamette. The forecast for those is, uh, both of those is slightly up from last year. Uh, and if we see that, um, hopefully we'll be seeing some signs of some rebound here. Uh, the large majority of both these stocks are hatchery production. And you'll note particularly for the upper uh, Columbia, Beginning in about 2000, 2001, we started to see um, essentially what are large improvements in hatchery performance for some of the Columbia stocks, and that drove a lot of that abundance that you see relative to the time frame before it. Um, the lower left is Upper Columbia Summer Chinook. And so before I say too much more about that, I want to point out there is a, a significant difference between Upper Columbia Summer Chinook and what I referred to earlier as Snake River Summer Chinook. The Upper Columbia Summer Chinook are far more uh, closely related to Upriver Bright Fall Chinook than they are Snake River Summers. They also have a later timing. Uh, the Snake River Summer component tends to come in primarily before mid-June at Bonneville Dam and the Upper Columbia Summer after that point, although there is some overlap. So there's a timing difference and there's a biological and genetic difference as well. The Upper Columbia Summers um, are uh, also have a hatchery and wild component. Uh, they, are, they are not a listed uh, stock. And again, you can see some real changes in about 2000. Uh, some of that hatchery, some of that probably habitat work and other restoration activities. This is a stock that hit a really low abundance in the late 1960s um, and kind of stayed that way through the mid 2000s um, for 
40 years or so, uh, Columbia fisheries were managed to largely avoid these fish because of their depressed status. And uh, we're seeing rebounds now. The last few years, <clears throat> excuse me, the last few years have been down relative to their prior uh, average, but uh, if you look historically, it's still significantly higher than they were prior to the 2000s. Okay, next figure, please. Okay, this one I tried to blow up a little bigger to give you some more room to see it. Uh, there's a lot of different fall Chinook stocks in the Columbia, several of them as we that we kind of treat as different units. Uh, we have a lot of information on that in our joint staff reports that we can point you to if you're interested. What I've shown here is just the two main components that we tend to hear about the most, the upper river brights and the tulies. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, similar to the spring Chinook graph on the prior page, the, the blue line indicates some of the other fall Chinook stocks. And you probably note uh, they tend to be a little more chunk of the total relative to the two I'm showing than the other spring stocks were on that page. Um, again, I'm going to focus on these two. Um, the upper river bright component. So we, we refer to brights in the Columbia. Uh, these are primarily upper river destined fish heading above Bonneville and into the upper, upper uh, basins of the Columbia. They enter the river at a lower, at an earlier state of maturity. And so they tend to be bright when they come in. That's where the moniker comes from. They're usually main stem spawners. For the upper river brights, the Hanford Reach component is the largest wild portion of the run. And those are fish that spawn in the last free flowing section of the Columbia up near the Hanford uh, Nuclear Reservation area. Um, and they remain a very healthy population. So, so they're one of our, our, our good populations in the basin. Um, doing well. Uh, there is still a substantial hatchery component of the Upper River Bright Run uh, from a variety of sources. The ESA component of the Upper River Bright Run is the wild return heading for the Snake River and we manage fisheries in the in the basin to uh, remain within conservation limits on that component in any given year and for this year that's actually the primary uh, stock Chinook stock driving fall fishery structures um, downstream of the Snake River uh, this year. Uh, moving to Thule's, which is the group on the bottom in the darker shade, uh, it's a smaller stock. Uh, the, the, these are stocks that, this is a stock that is generally headed for lower river tributaries downstream of Bonneville, although there are some populations above Bonneville. And they come into the river at a later state of maturity, they're more, they're closer to their spawn timing. And so they tend to darken pretty quickly compared to the brights uh, in terms of coloration and maturity. Uh, this stock has a listed component, the wild component in the lower river tributaries, particularly the Washington Shore tributaries uh, are the listed component and we manage fisheries uh, to remain within the conservation limits on that component. It often is a driver for, uh, it often is a constraining stock for the fall fisheries uh, that I discussed. And again, not surprisingly, given the ocean conditions and patterns we've seen in other stocks over the last few years, they've been uh, down relative to some past years. Uh, Upper River Brights in particular had reached a really high abundance in the 2013 through 16 sort of time frame or 15. And uh, so we're now in a, in a more down cycle. Um, but as again, as with other stocks, you can see these cycles occur over time and recur over time. Um, next slide. Okay, uh, Coho for the Columbia on the top right. Um, that is representing the total return to the Columbia and it's an aggregate of hatchery and wild combined in this case. Uh, more than half of the return is comprised of fish heading for places, uh, tributaries in areas downstream of Bonneville Dam, but there are components above. And those include some uh, uh, tribal reintroduction programs in the upper Columbian Snake Basin as well. Uh, and again, similar pattern of ups and downs last year uh, was forecasted to be a quite large return and ended up being uh, below average um, by, by a fair bit. This year's forecast is for a similar but slightly smaller return than last year and among the lowest ones we've seen uh, in recent years. The lower left portion is actually a subcomponent of that upper right figure and I've pulled out the lower Columbia wild coho component. These are wild ESA listed fish headed for tributaries below Bonneville primarily a handful above um, in, a, in the gorge area, but not much. Um, and this is another group we manage um, fisheries to remain under conservation limits in order to protect the stock. Um, the early part of the time series, you can see back into the mid 80s, early 90s, we have some very low abundances. 
uh, some higher abundances in more recent years, quite a bit of variability, um, and a little bit less forecasted this year than last, but uh, actually returns holding fairly steady for the last few years relative to some other things that have been going on. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, steelhead. Now these are um, return, uh, return numbers for Upper River Columbia steelhead. I'm only showing the A index and B index components of this. Uh, there is another um, upriver stock uh, that's smaller, um, comes in a little earlier. I'm not, I'm not showing that here. The trends tend to be similar uh, as anyway. Um, the A index is in the upper right, B in the lower left. Um, and as you're probably all aware, these are returns that have been significant concern in recent years. And you can see we've had some very low returns in those components before, and the last few years have been uh, particularly poor, even relative to some of those years, uh, in particular for B index steelhead. Um, the 2020 forecast for A index wild and hatchery components are, are a little improved over last year's, or the forecasts are higher than last year's actual return. Uh, something I noted that was unique for sort of the last few years on the A index that's a little different than the prior mid 90s sort of downturn is um, that the hatchery, the wild fish have been relatively similar to what they were in those mid 90s years, but the hatchery fish have done significantly more poorly. And I don't know, I haven't had time to dig into whether there's any production changes or anything else that might account for that, but it, it is something that I noted. Um, and the B index forecast for 2020 is, is again poor. It has been for several years. And as you'll recall, I mean, this is a run that we've uh, had particular concern over for the last several years. And beginning in 2017, I think it was, um, began enacting some pretty, uh, well, unprecedented actions in the fisheries in terms of what had occurred in prior years, uh, in terms of restricting on non-treaty non fisheries to try and create additional protections for those fish. And, and uh, we're in that same mode again this year. Uh, I believe we're intending to add some even further protections uh, relative to what we've even been doing over the last couple of years, which are, are much more than we, that had been done in some years in the past. Um, I apologize, I think I went through that rather quickly, but I was trying to save you some time if I could. I'm happy to, that's the last slide I had. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, this was just my wrap up slide. Thank you, Chris. Um, Scam packed um, report. That was great to hear. I'd like to ask a couple questions and then I'll start with the commissioners. I'll go to Commissioner Woolley and then Commissioner Zarnowitz just so you can have your questions ready. Um, the first question I have, Chris, is when are these um, available? When in the year are these available? And the reason I'm asking is I wonder if we could get something like this stock assessment in say December of each year so that we hear it before we start to see the temporary rules or before we need to start making decisions. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's a good one. Uh, they come in at different times, unfortunately, and the very earliest ones uh, are the Willamette and Upper River spring forecasts, which tend to be done in the early part of December. Maybe by the second week, we might have those. Uh, the fall forecasts, uh, fall Chinook forecast and coho forecast for the Columbia are usually, coho is usually the early part of February and Chinook is usually later in the month in February, so by mid to late February. The coastal Oregon and southern Oregon forecasts, I can't speak to the road, I'm not sure when the district con uh, conducts that forecast. The other populations in the southern part tend to be more spring, you know, March, April. Uh, we actually had a, a meeting to discuss some of those forecasts just, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, and the same with the North Oregon coast um, populations. Those are probably March. So um, we might be able to do it a little sooner than now if you wanted it in aggregate. Uh, but if you wanted it sooner, we'd have to, we'd have to stagger them in some way. Um, and we do generally, um, for the Columbia stocks in particular, when those forecasts are done, we do put them on the website and make sure they get published. So we could, we could probably, probably, at least one thing we could do is make sure those are, are sent to the commissioners when they come out um, they're posted, but we could directly send them if that was helpful. I think it would be helpful. And maybe we do need to just get them, just get, you know, 
sequentially, um, but it would be helpful to have this stuff when we're looking at the, the temporary rules and the, the proposals that are coming in front of us, or if we want to make any proposals ourselves, it would be useful to have this information early, as early as is possible. And it's clear that, that, you, that it's um, iterative because even some of the temporary rules that we're looking at today, there are rules that that modify ones that had been made in Feb. There are ones from now that modified February rules. So it's clear that this stuff is an ongoing thing. Um, the other one that I wanted to ask now is several of these had the natural pulled out from the from the mix of hatchery and natural. Is it possible to get these slides or is it a huge amount of work to get them with most of them pulled so that we can tease those two apart, the natural and Combined. Yeah, um, okay. it, it should be possible. Um, many of the populations for the um, for the coastal populations, um, elk has the hatchery component. Salmon River has a hatchery component. Most of the rest of them are entirely wild, but we could we could pull those out. Uh, the Columbia, we do have in general hatchery and wild returns. We could we could pull those apart. Yeah, and and in most cases. For the Columbia stocks, where hatchery and wild um, data are are split, our reports generally do that. Um, so we could, but we could package that up in some way. Yeah. Let me ask one more before I turn it over to yeah, data. Molly. Um, the other one is, you talked about at least one slide where the early two thousands there they looked almost like good news, and you talked about at least in one of those cases some of that was hatchery enhancement. Um, in that time, you know, we had relatively low ones from the 60s up until then, then we had some some enhanced or augmentation. Are most of the things that look like good news in that 2000 to 2010 time hatchery augmentation and that's look, making our numbers beefed up? Be beefed up? Um, I'd have to look at the hatchery and wild splits. My sense of it is that the the wild fish have trended sort of in their cycles up and down in the Columbia, upriver spring Chinook um, in particular, they've trended up and down in a sort of similar pattern, but they haven't, um, they haven't gotten, I mean, they're still in the, they're still listed. They're still not doing well, uh, many of those populations. And so, um, you know, those increases, a lot of it was hatchery production. And I'd have to probably um, much of that, pattern of change in the early 2000s predates my experience with it. And my understanding from talking to folks who were around in that time frame is um, not so much a change in hatchery production numbers, but it's something in the performance of those stocks uh, turned around and got better. And uh, Director Melcher may actually have a better answer for that portion of it, um, given his experience at that time than I do. But um, a lot of it, you know, the, again, I, I guess I'd say the trends in wild fish in terms of up and down tend to go in a similar cycle to the hatchery, but the general long-term trend is not upwards. Right. If, if I may, at least the spring. I may, Chair, while I just wanted to bring to your attention that um, uh, Tucker has his hand raised. Go ahead, Tucker. I saw your the video come on. Uh, Chair Wall, uh, Director Melcher, members of the commission, thanks. Tucker Jones here. Just also wanted, uh, I guess, I could have waited for Kurt to chime in, Director Melcher, if he wanted to, but uh, I would also say that around 2000, the ocean, that was one of those periods where the ocean turned around. That was also a time when we started some pretty aggressive uh, hydro system actions. Uh, so things would have been uh, going a lot better there. Spill really started ramping up. 2004, there was a de-emphasis on uh, barging. So some of that is also likely the combination of uh, of a better ocean and aggressive hydro system actions. Thanks. Thank you. That helps. Then Commissioner Woolley. And thank you, Chair Wall. So thank you for your presentation, Chris. Is I know you call it a high level. It seemed pretty detailed to me. Um, but in, you know, in your graphs, you're, you're showing the cyclical nature, you know, over time of these different fish stocks. And um, for example, maybe Chinook in the last two, three years, maybe an upward trend. But you know, we are in a, in a different time now with climate change and oceans warming. 
And so I'm just wondering how you how you consider that. I mean, kind of as a, a density independent variable, when you're doing your forecasting or your predictive modeling, it's lack of a better term, you know, kind of a, a, a mitigative influence in in that work. Um, could you just kind of address that as as you're looking forward, because we are in a, in a different time now. Thank you. Wait. Okay. Now it's on. Okay, I was muted for a second. Um. Yeah. Excellent question. I think the the first uh, part of that response is continuing to monitor populations and what they're doing in 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 as close to real time as we can get. And so getting out and having abundance estimates that are that are robust and appropriate for the population so we can see what they're doing. That's one aspect. Um, because as we see um, under climate change, continuing downturn levels that may extend longer than they had before, we need to be able to monitor that and adjust uh, what we can do, whether that's fisheries or other actions uh, in more real time. Uh, most of these populations, just from a fishery standpoint, do have uh, some form of abundance-based harvest management in that at lower levels, harvest is taken down and at higher levels, it may go back up. So there's some reflection in that. As a longer term issue, uh, there's a couple of things I'd probably point out. One is relative to maybe forecasting. Um, what we are seeing and have been seeing for many years now, uh, at least several years since I've been around, is um, I guess what I'd call increased uncertainty in forecasts. And some of that is due to what we're seeing in changing conditions. So if you think about our, our typical model approach, um, in, in sort of a forecasting mode is to look at past performance under certain conditions and say, if we see similar conditions in the future, we would hope for a similar response. Some of that's breaking down. We're seeing that. We've seen some missed forecasts in the last few years. There are continuing efforts to see what we can bring in from climate variables to try and, and ocean, oceanographic variables to add more precision to forecasts and hopefully catch some of those things. Those are ongoing, um, but again, the, the primary one and, and an important one is tracking what they're doing in real time. And then over the long haul, as you continue to see patterns and populations change, um, it is, it is uh, a live topic to talk about changing your management approaches over time too. So those, those will, you know, and if we look backwards to the last several decades, there have been changes in various management patterns, whether frameworks, whether they're at Pacific Fishery Council or within the state um, between then and now. And we have to be more adaptive and ready to, to look at those things going forward, I think. I don't know if that helps, but that's sort of a general response, I guess. No, that, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Sure thing. And uh, Chair Wall, this is Kurt Melcher. I'll, I'll take my hand down now. Yeah, down um, now. I just wanted to add that uh, yeah. I think it it may be it may be helpful in the future. We could also just provide a little informational update on what exactly goes into these salmon stock uh, forecasts. For instance, most, not all, but most of them are um, the result of basically age specific run reconstructions. They include a whole host of um, both. Uh, physical aging from scales, but also Cotowar tag recoveries to help uh, reconstruct those runs. And then there are uh, cohort regressions, many of which include um, environmental variables. Uh, so I, I think that might be helpful. And then the other point is just, um, just so you all know and understand that these aren't just our forecasts. So most of these, some of these are entirely our forecasts like Willamette Spring Chinook, but the rest of, um, or most of them are actually made uh, with our colleagues from uh, the treaty tribes, the federal agencies, other states, um, including the state of California, Idaho, Washington. So it's not, uh, you know, Chris isn't just sitting in a, in a room somewhere coming up with these forecasts, they're done collaboratively uh, with all the other co-managers and uh, agencies. Thank you.
Sorry, I missed your raised hand. I had moved the participant box out of the way so I could see the slide and couldn't get it back. So if you, so people should free, feel free if you, if I don't call on you to jump in. So let's go then to Commissioner Zarnowitz. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Wall. I have a, a couple questions. Uh, first, first one is uh, you didn't explain the numbers on your last slide of the steelhead because those numbers were very different than all the others. Chris? <laughs> Certainly. Um, might be helpful to put that slide back up. Is that possible, Kristen? Yeah, I'll do that right now. Yeah, I'll do that right now. And I will. Let me look here. Oh, yes. Thank you. It's an excellent point. The, the, um, these numbers are are in thousands. Uh, and so the uh, if you look at the hatchery component of the B index showing in the lower right, the 2019 return would be 5.4 thousand or 5,400. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. This is one of the ones that had a different scale on it because of the source data I had was in these units. So I apologize for that. Uh, does that answer the question sufficiently or did you need a little more? No, that's that's perfect. I, I thought that thank probably you for yeah, it was what it was. It was what it was. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is um, on uh, on the um, steelhead. I noticed that that there wasn't any uh, forecasts for the uh, coastal steelhead. Um, and I know that there had been, uh, when we were dealing with steelhead before, it seemed like we, you had uh, been extending most of your effort on the North Coast steelhead and uh, the rogue. So um, it'd be interesting to see what there is, also the umpqua, I guess, um, and elk on that in the future anyway. Obviously you can't pop that up right now, but uh, I don't know if you have the same type of, uh, um, I have an echo in my, my microphone. Um, you you um, may not have the same type of figures, but it'd be interesting to see what you have. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I can look into that with the districts. Um, again, this is, um, we have sort of a, a, a organizational chart of roles within the fish division. And that happens to be one that I don't spend a ton of time working on personally, uh, but we can certainly look at it with the districts uh, and see what we can come up with for a uh, future presentation. So that's the, in so that's the program? program. That's the end program? The program. Uh, primarily, yes. yes. But it's, okay. it's all doable. It's all within the division, so. Okay, all right. All right. And, um, There was one more, um, it, you know, long, long, long ago, it seemed like the water, uh, the amount of water one year um, predicted the, uh, the population three years or four years down the road. And it does, definitely seems like it's a lot more complex now with ocean conditions that, you know, hopefully are being measured by uh, NOAA or other entities and um, and all the various things that uh, sounds like you have a lot of formulas that you come up with, but uh, I guess how much do water conditions during the um, incubation and hatch of say Chinook, I'm, I'm sure coho it's probably even more critical, but since they rear over, but how much does that figure in? to your equations? Uh, thank you, excellent question. Um, the ones that I've shown today, I'm not aware that any of those use a water variable in their forecast. I am aware that in the past, some of the work that's gone on, particularly with uh, Coast Coho did, uh, some of the modeling efforts for population viability and other things. I'm not aware of any of the current methods including it, though they might. Um, the method for COSO includes several 
environmental variables. Some of those may not be directly um, in river water related, but they may be related in a sort of an overall basin climate perspective. In other words, uh, an ocean condition that might be associated with a period of, of uh, El Nino or La Nina where we get different rain patterns. Uh, we, we see a lot of cross correlations in some of these variables. I know um, one of the staff in the conservation program has conducted some modeling on uh, fall Chinook population abundances on the coast that did include some water uh, flow and I can't remember if it's stream height or flow variables and I don't know the specifics of what you know what the metric itself was but he definitely did include some of those. Um, we know that for the Columbia River um, migration timing for smolts coming down the system and how fast they're able to come down the system or how slow they are forced to come down the system can have a a large effect on their survival. So at varying points, uh, the group of folks that Director Melcher talked about earlier, what we call the Technical Advisory Committee in this case from the um, U.S. v. Oregon parties, which is tribal, state, federal, um, did include some, uh, and I think I was actually on the committee at the time, we did look at some of the water um, flow variables and things like that as, as to evaluate whether it was helpful in achieving more precision for the forecast. Um, what we found was in some cases it did, and in some cases uh, it seemed like other sources of variance would overwhelm it. But uh, so it's a long-winded answer. I apologize. I don't think any of the ones I showed you today have that in it directly, but we have looked at it in the past, and it is a it is a topic. Certainly, um, for coho, overwintering conditions are important. For chinook, fall flooding that comes after, or winter flooding that comes after spawning. Uh, an egg deposition has occurred, can scour reds, um, scour nests out and create survival problems. All of those things can happen. Um, how well we track them in any individual place uh, in terms of forecasting is, is pretty variable at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Labhart and then um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde and then um, Commissioner Spellbrink. So let's just go through the, the three. Commissioner okay. Labhart. Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, thanks, Tucker. I mean, thanks, Chris and Tucker for all your work. I know it's a hard job, um, but major decisions are being made based upon these forecasts. Um, Kurt answered my first question, which is um, what goes into the forecast? If we could get a copy of that, I'd appreciate it because we all know it's not a Ouija board in the back room and a lot of work goes into those forecasts. Um, the first question I have is the accuracy of the forecasting over time. Has there ever been an analysis made of, here's what our forecast is for this year, here's what it actually turned out. Here's our forecast for this year, here's actually what it turned out. So that's the first question I have. Certainly, um, the answer is yes. Um, almost all of the forecast, uh, as, as Director Melcher mentioned, these are all rolled together. I've I've basically collated a bunch of forecasts from various areas, including California, as well as our own um, sort of inter-jurisdictional inter inter work with other folks. Almost everybody that sits down and conducts a forecast at any individual time is also going to look past performance um, of how that forecast is doing. And uh, in order to present that here, the best way to do it would be to pick a few of them and walk through them in sufficient detail to get the to get the, the sort of gist of the issues uh, rather than try and present them all because it's just a lot. But um, definitely do that. Um, the, the folks that work in the Columbia and particularly for fall Chinook um, forecasts actually do it on, an, on any given year. They will look at the recent performance and past performance and they may shift. Uh, they normally look at a suite of different forecast methods and they may shift from one to the other or they may actually aggregate one or two or three of them in some fashion in a given year to address specific concerns of performance. So um, I'm having a trouble thinking of an example for you of that, but uh, I remember sitting down and going through forecasts such, you know, maybe we said for the last five years, we've used what, what Director Meltzer called the sibling regression, which is using the prior age class to predict the next um, for this stock and it hasn't been doing very well. But if we had used this other model that we also have but didn't use last year, it would have done better. So let's use that one this year. That happens a fair bit. Um, so almost everybody does that. The Willamette forecasts, I know, uh, they look at a suite of several different methodologies and track how each of them perform before settling in on what they're going to use at a given time. 
Um, I don't think that sort of uh, multiple model comparison is always done, but it is done at some in for a lot of these stocks. Okay, and I'm, again, just to be clear, because I'm not asking for an analysis to be done. I was just asking if we do that, and the answer here is yes. And you learn from that. When it's good, sometimes you make uh, continue, and if it's bad, you say, okay, what what made that happen, and learn from it. So, um, so has the accuracy, and this is kind of back to Commissioner Woolley's question, has the accuracy become more difficult over time, given the complexities that we're seeing with um, it seems like the things are becoming more complex all the time. Has has the accuracy become more uh, the uh, become more difficult in projecting, or is it still pretty much the same? What's your take on that? Um, for some stocks, it has. For some stocks, I would say it's not significantly changed. Some of them uh, tend to be pretty good. I I would have told you prior to last year that the Columbia River coho forecast was one that didn't seem to be uh, quite as affected by what I'd call increased variance, which is sort of the, the um, bouncing around the midpoint of the model, so to speak, has gotten bigger, bigger swings from the midpoint. Uh, we tend to fit a, if we're looking at a regression model, for instance, mathematically, we're basically fitting a midpoint through a bunch of data points. Uh, and we have seen in the Columbia, for instance, the observations on an annual year are, are drifting further away from those midpoints, both high and low. And so uh, in the long run, uh, if you're missing high one year and low the next, they may average out to still be a relatively uh, precise measurement in a statistical fashion, but the variance from year to year has gone up. Um, I mentioned coho last year on purpose because uh, it was one that generally is really stable over time. But in 2015 and 2019, we had big misses, and we're still going to be scrambling to try and figure out what, what that was. There was something we missed in the data. So I'd say in general, yes, and in a lot of places, yes. But it's not necessarily universal, but I'd say it's more often, more stocks than not, we are seeing more increased variation uh, on the forecasting side, at least for Shinda. Okay. Last question. Um, the we need to be, of course, congruent with Washington, or that's our chances to be as congruent as possible. Are they using the same graphs and the same data that you're using to draw the uh, projections that, that they're using also? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Uh, for the shared waters like the Columbia River, yes, uh, in fact, we jointly develop those. Uh, for fisheries that are for um, for forecasts that are relevant to establishing ocean fisheries, those basically go to the Pacific Fishery Council, which we're all members of. As the, both states are members of that council, and that council works through those forecasts and adopts them as a as a set of forecasts that we'll all use. So, uh, forecasts for a Puget Sound stock that Washington and the tribes may develop will be adopted by council as the forecast for that year, uh, and then that becomes the number for all of us. Uh, in terms of whatever its effects might, whatever the effects of the fisheries might be on that stock. And the same would go for, for our forecasts that get incorporated into that planning process. Great, thank you. Great. Sure thing. Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Hi, thank you, Chris, for um, this presentation. Um, it's deeply interesting to me to think through these issues. And, um, and I would also say it's uh, the cyclical nature, nature of the fishery is deeply unnerving, right? Like it's okay when it's going up, <laughs> but it doesn't feel very good when it's going down. And uh, I, I, I guess I just um, wanna say that this is one of those times that I'm in awe of the people who study this all the time on a regular basis for all of these different stocks and think through all of the multiple variables of uh, what might be going on in their health, you know, factoring in other issues like disease and, um, you know, the, the changes we've seen um, recently in the ocean conditions and, you know, how much does uh, do climate issues and the, the the changes and when we're seeing our precip precipitation weigh in. Um, I don't really have a question. I just have to say that uh, 
I, I just wish I could hang out with, with you and all the fish guys for like a month and we just talk about it and, and uh, throw darts on the ball for a while. Why these different things uh, might, might happen. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I'd, I'd be happy to do anything I can to make that happen. Okay, thanks. I don't think it's in the budget. <laughs> Especially right now, we're on. Uh, we we need to be in coronavirus frugality. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Commissioner Spellbrink. Uh, Chair Wall. Uh, yeah, I have some. I thought I'd just maybe mention some real positives uh, on the. You know, we didn't really talk about winter steelhead since we you know had the petition earlier in the uh, in the year and. Uh, I think you know what we saw this year is at least what I'm hearing from fishermen and, and everyone else is that it was really strong winter steelhead run on the coast here this year. Some of the best fishing in years seemed to be a strong wild component too. I know in the sluts, the Umpqua were both you know really really good. It seemed like they had uh, good runs of fish. And then I see the Willamette uh, winter steelhead now is too. It's good positive there. It uh, was over five thousand fish. I saw the last over the falls there last I looked. So some real positive things there. Uh, the uh, one other thing I might mention here too on uh, right now we're seeing some good coastal conditions with this nice weather we've seen here in the valley. It's, there's on the coast it's been the good you know northwest winds. You're getting upwelling. The spring transition time is always important for all marine species, uh, plus then admirable fish, the fish going out. So uh, we, we're seeing some pretty good, you know, local ocean conditions right now. I think you see that from the squid fishery. And I know that herring spawn seem to be good. So anyway, I think that we're seeing some positives there on the ocean right now too. It's very important this spring trend, when the spring transition takes place, where these north winds come, it's, you know, if we don't, if we have years when we don't get that uh, spring transition and the northwest winds uh, that the marine species and, and our salmon steelhead don't do very well either. So. These are some positives. Uh, the one question I did have for Chris was uh, on our uh, mid and north coast fall Chinook regulations for this coming fall. I've had a lot of fishermen ask me about those. And, you know, usually you have the public meetings, which I don't know if we'll have this year because of the COVID uh, problem. And and uh, how, how are we going to develop the, those coastal fall regs this year? And uh, when will that be? There we go. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, so I'll do the question first, and then if I could, I've got a comment on your on your first part as well because um, I agree. Uh, we are actually uh, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago to begin the discussion of what fall looks like for this year in the coastal rivers. Um, we're still compiling sort of the uh, the planned actions that we might think about. Uh, I'll tip a little bit here. The North Coast is looking better than it did last year, so I think we'll I think we'll be less restrictive there than we were. Um, the mid coast, I, I not well mid south end. I'm not positive of. We've still got some some stocks that are down there that I think we're still going to need to pay attention to, um, uh, in terms of a, re a regulation process. So we should be um, we should be wrapping those up within the next. I would say at least within the next month, so that we could get notice out to folks. Some of the some of the rivers have a sort of spring summer component to the regulations that, that could be affected. So it'd be important to get those notified fairly soon. Um, that's about the best I can give you for now, because we're still again, um, kind of collecting the proposals from the districts and evaluating those versus the coastal multi-species plan. Um, but that's an active conversation right now. Um, relative to ocean conditions, I think, um, you know, I, I, I may not have mentioned the blob from a few years ago, but um, that was that warming water up in the Gulf of Alaska. And, and while we didn't get the warming water itself necessarily, one of the things it did do is create a high pressure ridge that was very, um, they call it the ridiculously resilient ridge, if I recall properly, but it kept the wind patterns um, sort of abnormal and killed our upwelling um, during that period. And you're right, that's one of the most important pieces, not only the transition date when it starts, but also sort of the magnitude of how big of, or how much upwelling occurs, so to speak. Um, I mentioned that because those are actually two of the variables that are in that red, red light, green light chart that I showed earlier, among others. Um, those are two big ones. So absolutely spot on. Um, we've seen a little bit of improvement in the last couple of years relative to upwelling, and I'm hopeful that, that that's uh, going to 
carry forward to better survival. Thank you, Chris. I have one more question before we um, let you off the hook. So one of the things that I, I think all of your slides, except the first one, the Sacramento one, 2020 looked um, worse than the the 10 year average. It looked better than 2019, but in all cases, except I believe the Sacramento, it looked better than 19, but worse than the 10 year average. And so it makes me wonder, maybe if we know why, that would be wonderful, but I don't know how you would do that. But um, also if you said something or you mentioned offhandedly, I think trends, and it would be great if we could see where the trend lines are headed with these. Certainly, um, I'll, I'll mention that there's a couple things in play there. One is, is um, sort of the selection of a 10 year period is a choice. Um, some of those populations, for instance, the Upper Columbia, uh, Upper River Brightstock had some of the highest abundances we'd ever seen within the early part of that 10 year period. And so they're weighing in on that 10 year average. Um, I think you want to look at the figures themselves and sort of, you could draw a line across all years to look at it. Um, there is always the, the issue of uh, sort of choosing which time period to use. Do you use them all? Do you use a certain set? Do you use a, um, so I take your point. Um, I think some of the averages, uh, yes, below the 10 year. Um, I don't know if they're below the three or the five year or how they relate to the 20 year. Um, but in some of those cases, I think you're seeing a pattern of some fairly high numbers in the early portion of that 10 year average that I've captured that are driving that average up as well. But the point I think is important, the last few years have been down relative to that average and they've been uh, for most of these stocks in sort of the lower range, even if you look back more broadly. So um, the big question is how long do those downturns last? Uh, well, a big question is how long do those downturns last? Maybe not the big question. Um, so I, I don't know that that directly answers your question. We could certainly look at a, at a different um, uh, averaging approach in future presentations that captured more years or something like that if we wanted to. But um, part of why I wanted to show the bar charts themselves was so that uh, you didn't have me interpreting the time frame that I think you should look at. You could just look at the whole thing yourselves and, and sort of get your head around it and, and see as much of the time frame as I, as I could find um, some of these go back further, some of them don't. So um, anyway. Thank you. And I think for me, the, the more interesting thing might be um, whether it is a downturn and it is, it is just another cycle. We talked about more variance and all of the climate change conditions. And that seems the toughest part to, to tease out, of course. So, so thank you very much for the report. Hugely interesting. Um, commissioners, we're at 1130. We have another um, significant significant time um, presentation. I think that unless I see a bunch of thumbs down, we need to just keep going because we don't have plans to stop for lunch or anything like that. So I say we just keep going for at least one more presentation and I'll check in with you to see if we need a break then before we do the others. Thumbs up. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. That was very interesting. Um, let's move then to cold water refugia, if we could, and Tucker Jones. Hello. Go ahead, we can hear you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Wall, members of the Commission, Director Melcher. For the record, I am Tucker Jones, and I am the Ocean Salmon and Columbia River Program Manager. Uh, and that's right, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where we are with our cold water refuge and thermal angling sanctuary uh, process. So next slide, please. Uh, before we get going, just a, a brief outline. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process and where we're at in it, uh, some background about why and what we're doing, uh, a review of some work uh, that the EPA has done that's informed our process, uh, our process exactly, and then potential management actions. Uh, before we move on, I guess just a process status update. 
uh, had really been our intent um, to be moving forward with this uh, process for permanent rulemaking or consideration of permanent rulemaking this year. Uh, we had scheduled a public meeting uh, up in the Gorge area to discuss with folks uh, the COVID pandemic and the governor's uh, executive order forced us to sort of reassess. Uh, we had to move that public meeting online. We did stream it over YouTube, uh, similar in a similar format to what I think we're doing here today. Uh, but given the sort of notice on that and the uncertainty surrounding everything, uh, really have decided that uh, we need to have that sort of robust public process uh, to help inform you guys and to inform us. And so we're really planning on dealing with 2020 through temporary rule uh, and then you know, assuming that we all get a return to some sort of normal life, though, so, you know, maybe we'll substitute elbow bumps for uh, handshakes. Uh, we'll be able to have that robust process. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, why is this an issue right now? Um, I guess, you know, we've been seeing increasing temperatures in the Columbia River over the last, you know, 50, 60 years. Uh, and this is a trend that is projected to get worse uh, in the next 50 years. So, uh, you know, we've had some warming temperatures. Climate change is a real and pressing danger, and it's something that we need to, you know, be out in front of and tackle head on. Next slide. Uh, we've also seen uh, what amounts to a, a declining trend in summer steelhead. Uh, over the last 20 years ago. Again, runs uh, are cyclical, uh, but we have seen sort of, a, even if you take that cyclical nature into effect, uh, a declining trend in in summer steelhead. This is a combined total return of both those A and B index summer steelhead that are heading back to Snake River. Uh, so I guess I would say that al although we have that upward trend in temperature and a, a downward trend and fish and those have sort of co-occurred. Uh, I do think, you know, uh, I guess seeing as I would ordinarily pound on this issue from the other side, that it's important to remember that uh, correlation does not uh, necessarily equal causation. So uh, just keeping that in mind. Next slide. Uh, so again, uh, this slide and some of the stuff you're about to see is some information from uh, work on cold water refuges that the EPA has done uh, over the last several years. They, they released their draft cold water uh, refuge plan last October. Um, we did provide comment on that ODFW in December. Uh, to my knowledge, we have not seen a, a final plan on that as of yet. Um, but you know, really, in that plan, the EPA identified uh, 191 tributaries uh, to the Columbia River, uh, some of which provide cold water refuge to varying degrees, others do not. Um, the purple on this slide indicates sort of large temperature differentials between the tributaries, uh, the green smaller uh, and large cooler uh, temperature differentials. Green is also a cooler temperature differential, but as you move into orange and, and red circles, those are actually warmer inputs than the main river. Um, those green and purple areas are the sort of cold water areas that we're talking about uh, and are the potential areas to consider. Next slide. Uh, of these 191, there are 12 uh, primary areas identified uh, by the EPA, six of which um, happen to be Oregon tributaries. If you, uh, Kristen just wanted to advance once. Um, there you go. There are your six Oregon uh, tributaries. Um, you know, half of these being on Washington uh, sort of I guess impacts to a degree how much we can do. Um, but these are the six that we've looked at uh, within Oregon. Why don't we go ahead and advance to the next slide, please? Uh, so 
the EPA, as I said in that report, they identified those areas. They identified the, the 12 primary. We know which ones the Oregon are. Uh, there is some issues that we did have uh, in that report. There's a lot of really great work um, in there, but some of the the information, their fish behavior information, is uh, based on information gathered from telemetry studies that were conducted in uh, from 1999 through 2004. There have been uh, some major systemic changes that have occurred since then uh, that have really sort of had effects that we know of on uh, fish behavior. Uh, perhaps the, the biggest thing that changed is that right in 2004, 2005, there was a major uh, de-emphasis in uh, barging fish from the Snake River. Uh, you can see in the figure below the, the sort of the proportion transported um, hovering in that, you know, 80 to 90% to range for Chinook and Steelhead uh, prior to that de-emphasis and dropping really into the 30s and, and 40%. So major change in, in what we were doing with those fish through the system. Uh, and we know that really impacted stray rates in a lot of uh, the tributaries. Those stray rates, uh, especially for Steelhead, went down um substantially uh, also within the deschutes river there is a, a a mixing tower uh like billy chinook that came online and, and that has also changed something that's in there and so this doesn't mean that fish are necessarily using these areas differently uh but we do know that you know there's been some pretty major changes and if uh you're basing some of what you're doing on on that behavior and stray rates that were associated from those that information uh, that that could come into play. Um, they don't really hit about this in the in the report too much, but ladder fish ladder temperature differentials in the main stem uh, also really have a big impact on migrations. And and if we could do uh, work to mitigate those that were basically the top end of the fish ladder is warmer than the bottom end of the fish ladder and so it delays migrations or can uh, that would also help in the system um, there was some fisheries related impacts that they talked about in that report that uh, seemed to us to be somewhat speculative you know all that being said though this concept of cold water refuge and fish using it it's not counterintuitive it it makes sense so uh you know we think that's important we think there are you know on the whole that work by the epa was really good uh there are just a few issues we'd like to see uh, addressed next slide please uh so uh, coming around back to the oregon process columbia uh, fisheries management is uh complex um our process needs to take that into account. You know, it's, a, it's an intricate exercise in managing for weak and listed stocks of salmon and steelhead uh, and working with our co-managers on that. Uh, you know, where the impacts accrue by species varies. Uh, for example, the majority of recreational uh, wild uh, wild beef steelhead or wild steelhead in general impacts a crew upstream of Bonneville Dam. Uh, and actually for that uh, wild bee component, uh, the majority of the non-treaty impacts a crew upstream of Bonneville. Uh, so actions need to take, you know, species and stock specifics into account. Um, some of the other things going on, we look at, at some of the tributaries downstream appear to, of Bonneville appear to be uh, less critical. Uh, there was a report uh, to the EPA uh, by the Columbia River Estuary Partnership that uh, determined that, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the EPA had identified the Sandy River as one of their primary areas, but they did not. They were looking at August at the Sandy and they did not notice the same temperature differential. So uh, not necessarily sure on, why, on that. Um, they also noted that, uh, you know, flows from Tanner Creek and those other gorge tributaries were not really uh, enough to influence the main river. Um, and so, uh, you know, given this, our focus, we've, you know, given that, you know, we don't really have uh, what appear to be uh, meaningful 
cool water areas downstream of Bonneville, uh, and that most of the impacts accrue upstream of Bonneville. We've decided to, to really focus our uh, attention at this time there. Um, and then, uh, you know, when considering if we're going to use cold water uh, refuge areas or thermal angling sanctuaries, we want to make sure that if we do that, we have boundaries that satisfy four criteria, that they're easily definable in rule, uh, that they are recognizable by our participating anglers, uh, they're enforceable by law enforcement and, and hopefully biologically meaningful. Next slide. Uh, so what should the basis for thermal sanctuary action be on? What should we base this on? Uh, for a variety of factors, steelhead are actually the best, uh, we focused there a little bit today, but they're actually the best species in there suited to benefit from these cold water refuge areas and, uh, and the thermal angling sanctuaries due to their uh, particular life history characteristics. Uh, steelhead have a, a long body clock while they may be migrating in uh, you know July, August, September, October, they're not gonna be spawning until the following uh, winter and spring. So they have the ability to use these areas and wait uh, for temperature conditions in the main stem that are uh, more preferable to them. Uh, whereas sockeye or summer chinook or fall chinook have a body clock, they need to be spawning uh, that fall. So holding up a long time in these areas is actually detrimental to uh, those populations. Um, again, so thinking about steelhead, uh, do we use an aggregate? Do we use hatchery? Do we use wild? Um, we really know that these wild bee steelhead have had very low numbers for a while. Um, and so we are really focused on providing those protections, though there are times we need to make sure that we're meeting our hatchery brood stocks as well. But, but for a trigger, uh, you know, you don't usually see a time, um, and also then focusing on the bees, you don't really see a time when bees are up and A's are down. And so uh, just to try to make decisions a little simpler and not have a uh, uh, a Rubik's cube sort of matrix or uh, something overly complicated. We're really looking to sort of those wild bees. And you can see on the figure and right, they actually track pretty well with the wild A's. Uh, so this is what we're basing uh, those sort of decisions on. Um, but they would provide protections also for the wild A's during that time and hatchery steelhead as well. Next slide. I keep getting ready to hit my own arrows on my computer, but I I realize I don't have that control for the, I'm not sure how I feel about that, to be honest. Um, so when to take uh, these sort of actions, if we're going to use these thermal angling sanctuaries, uh, there's a, sort of a general time period where things are warming up uh, to uh, in the river and also things are cooling in the tributaries. Uh, the idea between the, cold water refuges is that um, it's, you need to have that dichotomy. If you think back to that uh, original figure with the purple and green dots, um, if temperatures between the river and the main stem are not different, then there's no real draw to those areas. Uh, a couple of these areas are cold all the time, but especially the Deschutes, uh, because of that uh, cooling tower I talked about, it takes a while for it to actually set up. And you start to look at this area and, and where you have warmer waters uh, and those cooler temperatures in the tributaries, it really sort of sets up in this area between July 15th to September 15th. So we think that we would, if we're going to use these actions, we would probably put them in place for just this fixed uh, time frame. Next slide. Why not uh, uh, use a temperature trigger to decide when to do that? Well, temperature itself it is pretty variable, uh, both across years and within years. Uh, and we don't think we want to be in a spot where we are potentially opening and closing these spaces on a, on a daily basis. Um, our angling public is uh, pretty uh, resourceful and adaptive, you know, conservation minded folks. Uh, but what's hard is when, and so they can, you know, make plans, uh, if you have something that they can look at and see, but if you're trying to shift things uh, on them constantly, that can be difficult. I mean, that's not to say that 
if conditions arise, we wouldn't take additional actions. We'd do that pretty regularly, but, but at least having something to plan from from the outset, I think is important for those folks. Next slide. So uh, what actions to take? Um, this is a, our draft uh, matrix. Uh, it's not a, a fully finished product, but it, it's pretty well formed at this point. And, and what we're using, uh, as I said, for our 2020 uh, process, uh, there are, uh, if you look within the table, right, you have a forecast abundance for those wild bees, uh, and then sort of a pre-season or in-season proposed action. Um, again, noting that additional measures may be implemented uh, based on physical conditions or run updates. Uh, and then also knowing that, you know, fisheries are managed to ensure that we're below our ESA constraint. Um, NOAA is, uh, and the federal government have established these uh, impact rates on these listed stocks for steelhead. Uh, there, it has to be for all non-treaty fisheries, less than 2% on these fish. Uh, we look at that, we have an above average forecast, we would say uh, in the 75th percentile. And this is uh, includes all return years from 1984 to 2019. So uh, 25, 26 years worth of data to look at here. Uh, and it's the wild bee again, component to Bonneville Dam. Uh, average uh, sort of the 25th percentile uh, of these runs below average and then a well below average. So if we're looking at a large run, uh, we wouldn't probably plan, you know, an above average run, any sort of permanent regulations on here. Uh, anytime we are in a, uh, an average sort of situation, we would be uh, thinking about thermal angling sanctuaries for uh, those tributaries, most of those upstream of Bonneville Dam on the Oregon side. Uh, when we're below average on runs, we will be talking about, you know, thermal angling sanctuaries plus uh, additional measures. Uh, and if well below average, those sanctuaries plus extensive steelhead retention or other angling closures. Um, if the abundance triggers are met, we would use that July to 15th, uh, July 15th to September 15th uh, uh, window to help provide some stability for those anglers again. Uh, the boundaries on these areas are still under development. Uh, I think, you know, again, it'll be difficult or impossible to empirically quantify uh, several of the benefits uh, uh, of the uh, likely actions included in the framework um, due either to insufficient information or uncertainty in the effectiveness of the actions, especially here, uh, this, you know, plays into uh, account for the, the thermal angling sanctuaries. Again, I, I think, it's important to note that while we're looking to provide opportunity, and that's really important, our management strategies are focused uh, on the recovery of stocks. And while we think this is a, a solid foundation uh, to help us uh, provide those management protections, ensure we're below our 2% and really um, you know, err on the side of the fish, uh, additional measures and actions would always be available based on real-time information. Next slide, please. So again, talked about this, uh, most of the non-treaty YLB impacts accrue in recreational fisheries upstream of Bonneville Dam. Uh, most of the non-treaty impacts in general on wild bees are up there. Uh, so focus up there. However, the, just the depth profile and the large alluvial fan at the mouth of the Hood River um, largely eliminate its potential as a uh, steelhead cold water refuge. Uh, so we're really looking at Eagle Creek, Herman Creek, and the Deschutes River here. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an aerial photo of uh, Eagle Creek, along with the sort of thermal temperature plume here. You can see the I-84 bridge. Eagle Creek is the most uh, downstream of the areas we're talking about. It's uh, really almost immediately upstream of Bonneville Dam. Um, does definitely set up and have these sort of thermal areas. Uh, and so we would be proposing the sort of the following boundaries here. Next slide, please. So closed uh, inside, uh, and we'd have to have a couple of regulations here because uh, upstream of the bridges actually falls into a different set of regulations, but uh, closed essentially uh, from the mouth uh, up to the 
angling deadline, which is near where our hatchery is. Uh, we put some boundary signs on the outside and then run it out through uh, the red navigation number four. And this would be an area closed to uh, angling during the period of time. Next slide. This is Herman Creek. It's uh, the middle one. It's right near Cascade Locks. Uh, Herman Creek is quite cold, as you can see from the thermal imaging. Uh, and because of these sort of boundaries, uh, this uh, jetty that's outside of it, it, it it's quite large, uh, and it extends upstream and downstream. Um, next slide. Uh, Herman Creek also has a uh, youth and disabled angling area in there. Uh, to access it as an adult, you have to have a disabled angling license. Uh, so slightly different regulations. Most of this area would be uh, closed, you know, during the time period to angling. Uh, but we would propose leaving uh, that youth and disabled angler area uh, open uh, during this time period uh, to those people uh, who can legally access the dock. Uh, next slide. So the most upstream and the uh, and moving into the next reservoir is the Deschutes River. Uh, has less of a profile necessarily than the others, but it is also the largest and um, and importantly the most uh, the last sort of cold water refuge fish have in the river before uh, they make it home. Uh, the tributaries upstream of here. Uh, on the Oregon shore, the major ones, the John Day, the Umatilla, uh, are all warmer, if you recall those other, uh, that initial map with this slide. So this is the last one on the Deschutes. The, uh, this we also have had uh, a couple, the last few years angling sanctuaries on here. The next slide will show our, uh, the boundaries that we used in um, 2019 and what we would propose in the future. Uh, this and captures most of the cool water you know again this shows sort of a you know a, an off and on switch in the thermal profile but of course it'll it'll blend a little uh and along a gradient here this provides uh, major protections we think for most of the fish that will be using these cold water areas but still allows uh you know chinook angling outside of this area so again close to angling inside and, and we would have this running up to uh, Moody Rapids, there's a pit tag detector at Moody. We know that most of uh, the out of basin fish are not ascending above there uh, in this area. So that's why we've used that as our proposed boundary on the Deschutes. Next slide. Uh, what are some of the other potential management actions we might use? Uh, sport options, we've used reduced bag limits. We've done these rolling retention uh, closures for steelhead where you close off a portion of the time where most of the impacts would accrue. Uh, we've used river-wide retention closures. Uh, you can restrict boat or party limits. Um, we've used these thermal angling sanctuaries, or you can just do outright uh, uh, angling all fish enclosures. Uh, again, for the commercial fisheries, we've uh, shifted the timing of openers. We've reduced numbers. You can reduce the duration or soak times. You can use gear restrictions uh, and also fishery closures to reduce impacts. Next slide. Uh, how have these actions worked? Uh, we are looking here at some of our creel data uh, for the Deschutes area. This is not necessarily specific uh, for the closure area, but it does include uh, major sampling points uh, for the Deschutes area. I think some of you may have seen this uh, a little bit before. Uh, if you look at 2016, uh, we had a one steelhead bag limit uh, after September 1st. We saw, you know, pretty decent effort and actually handle of steelhead uh, uh, during that year. It was a, a larger run year. Uh, in 2017, and uh, we use those rolling retention closures um, to help reduce impacts. Uh, in the Deschutes, that included a, an outright closure from the mouth of the Deschutes upstream again to Moody Rapids. Uh, you can see that the, the, the handle of steelhead went down dramatically. 
uh, during this period, the effort still remained uh, decent. In 2018, uh, we put uh, we also um, had closures, but we used a, an ang that thermal angling sanctuary for the first time. Uh, the commission guidance there was to use the existing commercial sanctuary or, or something similar. Uh, we we chose something similar. The the existing commercial sanctuary language is something like a half a mile upstream, uh, out to the middle of the river, then following the thread of the river downstream to a point. It, it, so it identified markers that were no longer there and things. Uh, if we think back to those four criteria. I mean, you can identify that in rule, but it's not really recognizable by anglers, and it was hard to enforce uh, by the law enforcement guys. Um, so we was, we used a, a large chunk of the river there. That uh, that you know definitely reduced uh, even further steelhead handle, but it uh, also really really clamp down on effort in that area. People weren't able, that area included most of the water where people were Chinook fishing. Uh, and so really reduced effort. In 2019, uh, we would had a, a public meeting in January of 2019. We got some public input on our, our boundary. Um, so we refined that boundary to what we showed you in that last Deschutes figure. Uh, we still had really minimal uh, steelhead handle using that sanctuary. Again, we also had the rolling closures here. Uh, retention closures, uh, but also decent effort in that area, which meant so basically people uh, were staying off and away from steelhead while still being able to access uh, more abundant Chinook uh, resources. Um, uh, I think that you know what we see is, here is that the rolling closures uh, really reduce steelhead handle. Uh, the effect of the sanctuary is less clear, um, but you know, we do know that these rolling retention closures are working to uh, reduce handle. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some claims that people will continue to target steelhead after retention is closed. Uh, we just, we don't have evidence to support that. And it's, and it's not that we haven't been looking. Next slide. Um, climate change is a, is a challenge and it's going to challenge uh, both the fish and fisheries management uh, now and into the future. And this issue is a, a priority for ODFW and we're actively working on it. Uh, I think thermal angling sanctuaries are a, a means to provide additional protections. This is a, you know, using a precautionary approach. Um, we may not be able to quantify the benefit of these thermal angling sanctuaries at this time, but, but we know that they're an additional protection uh, during a time period where things are going. Um, but we, we also, I think, need to balance those protections uh, with other fisheries and management needs, including our interjurisdictional coordination. Um, again, though, right, our management strategies are focused on recovery of listed stocks first and then uh, providing, you know, opportunity where uh, possible, but in balance with that. Um, I think it's important to remember that, that conservation and, and use are not uh, mutually exclusive activities. Um, you know, our, the opportunity we're providing is not considered, it's, we're not thinking about it outside of this conservation frame. Uh, and I think, you know, personally that conservation works best with an actively engaged public. You know, opportunities in general are scaled, uh, you know, harvest is scaled to avoid excess impact to those uh, listed and weak stocks. Um, the seasonal allowance, seasonal allowance of take or the exploitation rate uh, on those listed stocks is based on uh, federal levels and those preseason forecasts. Uh, we develop in coordination with our cool managers fisheries based on these allowances. Uh, and our management framework is you know, how we manage within that constraint. Um, we do have in-season management uh, that we engage in regularly. It's based on real-time issues, conditions, uh, run sizes, uh, and you know that's something that everybody is used to and that we are committed to. Uh, I guess we again don't have uh, the means. I think I hit on this once before to quantify the benefits of these angling sanctuaries. Um, 
and we may never, but we know that they're not going to be detrimental to the fish. That's for sure. Uh, and especially when we've been looking at some of these low run sizes, it, it's time to start getting aggressive. I think with some of these actions, um, we are currently collecting, um, uh, feedback on these sort of existing proposals. I, like I said, I gave this as a, uh, a larger version of this talk back in, uh, March I streamed it out over YouTube. Um, and we've been getting some feedback on that. Uh, and hopefully that'll be helpful in our future process. But again, also, we want to have additional in-person meetings uh, for people who, like me, may be technologically challenged and, and struggle to attend some of these online uh, forum. We, we want to have a, a robust process that allows uh, everyone to engage. So next slide. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions after I get a sip of coffee. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tucker. Um, Kristen, can you go back to slide 12, if you will, of Tucker's part? Tucker, my, my question is, is really, really basic. Um, and I've been making an, is that 12? I thought 12 was, yeah, that's, 12 is the, uh, the, the matrix. It is the matrix. And the question is this, and it's, it's fundamental to what you're talking about, I think, which is I've been reading this and listening to you and assuming that from July 15th to September 15th, sanctuaries are closed, no harvest, period. And then the additional actions, all of these others that you're talking about are main stem actions that we can take in addition to those um, closing the sanctuaries for that period. Is that a safe assumption? Yes, the, we would talk about closing the chair wall. We would talk about closing to angling those thermal angling sanctuaries during that time period. Uh, and then the additional measures are not uh, Though I do think the uh, the additional measures are not necessarily uh, limited to or restricted to uh, that time period. Good. So those would be yeah. targeted. They may be broader or narrower depending on uh, conservation need. Okay. Um, my other question, and then I'll open it up. And commissioners, just so you know, I'll start with um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, and then Commissioner Zarnowitz and then Commissioner Spellbrink, Labhart, Woolley. So if you just wanna keep moving and then it'll speed it up, I think a little bit, if we can just go through and the next person just start asking their questions. Um, the next one, you mentioned several times, Tucker, that we, we are using, we're trying to be precautionary. These numbers are on the, especially the bees are low um, and we're, not 100% sure or even close to 100% sure of the outcome or the biological outcome, but we know there is, they use these sanctuaries a lot. So are we also doing monitoring evaluation research on these this year or next year? Sure, well, I, the question is, are we monitoring separately doing any monitoring or evaluation RME in the thermal angling sanctuaries? Or we, um, have a, yeah. we have a creel. So in the fall, well, in the, usually in the spring, although not this year, uh, as salmon and sealed fisheries are closed. Uh, currently, we have a, a creel both below Bonneville Dam and upstream of Bonneville Dam that monitors catch, uh, effort, handle, uh, and release. And we will be doing that if we have any fisheries uh, there. As far as targeted research in these areas, we don't have anything ongoing with that. Good. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, your questions. Go ahead, Commissioner Hatfield. Hey, well, thank you for the presentation, Tucker. And um, uh, I, I guess I'm curious about how you actually, how the regulation of this happens and, you know, how frustrated is the, the general angler by this? Um, what kind of feedback do you get? I mean, it, it's, I'm just curious. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Hatfield-Hyde. Um, 
I think that the general angler uh, is really, you know, in my experience, has been very conservation minded. Uh, I think there's a mix. Some people, you know, everyone uh, that I've heard from wants to make sure that we're providing protections and adequate protections for steelhead. Everyone wants to see these fish recover. Um, some people are fully supportive of this concept of thermal angling sanctuaries. Uh, others would like to be able to see the benefit, uh, you know, quantified for them. Um, you know, I think they're a little frustrated that we can't do that. You know, honestly, I'm frustrated that we can't do that. We just we don't have the means really to, to provide what that, uh, you know, benefit in terms of fish saved is going to be that we can do with, you know, the other sort of fish closures that we have, uh, retention or angling closures. Um, but everybody is committed to, you know, conservation that I've talked to on this and, and wants these fish to go. I think um, they like, and part of what this does is provide stability too, right? I mean, what will help ease frustration uh, will be, um, you know, having something that you can see, you know, predictability. And if you know that something's going to be closed early on, then you don't plan a fishing trip to go there only to have it sort of lost at the last minute. So that will go a long ways, I think, in reducing frustration. Uh, and then I think you, did you have a, question on permanent rulemaking uh, or, or no. did I okay no. okay sorry I'm not that right. smart yet on, <laughs> okay rulemaking. let's let's be honest uh, right. I I what I um my question was how how is how do how does the enforcement work uh how does the enforcement work well we'll post sign um with these sorts of things, you know, I don't, you know, directly supervise the law enforcement uh, division, but uh, my experience with the law enforcement, OSP law enforcement and our guys, it's sort of a combined effort will be sort of an education first approach. Uh, you know, this is a new concept and a new idea and uh, um, everyone out there usually anglers included are working to try to to make things better for the fish uh and so you know generally first contacts are about educating and and helping people understand about what we're doing and why we're doing it uh, that being said i'm sure that uh, almost everything as with almost everything uh attitude in a particular instance can also impact how the contact goes so Okay, it looks like I'm next. Um, thank you, uh, Tucker. And also I didn't compliment both Chris and you for your presentations. Um, very informative. Uh, what is Washington, I have two questions. What is Washington doing on this, on their side? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Uh, Washington is, uh, you know, engaged in looking at this. I think they have taken more, uh, they have, uh, I think declined so far to engage in a broad process. Uh, they've looked at this more on a, a year by year basis uh, and are looking at potential targeted closures, um, but they've not at this time uh, engaged with us on the larger process, which is why you kind of see us looking at, at our regulations on our side of the river. Um, and the second question is, um, uh, these are going to be permanent rules that this will happen every year. Is that correct? Uh, so not, so sorry, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, uh, at this point in time, we are planning on dealing with 2020 under temporary rules. Uh, we would bring this to the commission for your consideration, uh, right? I wouldn't be, pre I, I could not be pre-decisional on what your decisions would be on that, but we plan on, you know, as soon as this uh, lessens up, going through that process, running these proposals out and letting the public engage, and then bringing them to you for you to be able to consider the public input received, uh, our proposals, and then for you to make your own decisions uh, then uh, for out years. Hopefully, uh, you know, 
I guess that's not real wood. It sounds more metal than wood. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, we'll be able to engage in this process uh, later this summer or fall and be able to bring this back to you. Yeah, I, I guess my feeling is that um, it shouldn't just be a temperature trigger. It should be something that happens every year, given the conditions that we're seeing over the over time. But thank you. Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner Zarnowitz, that would be uh, once we, if we did bring this to the commission for permanent rulemaking and you guys did decide to do that, that would be, uh, that would be how it would work. We would use those sort of forecast matrices uh, and then we would know about this time of year, whether or not we were going to be having those uh, in, a, in a given year. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Labhart. Oh, sorry, I thought Bob was ahead of me. I was actually just waving at my wife outside. <laughs> so, okay, but I'll go ahead. Tucker, I want to thank you for that uh, March public meeting that you held. I actually think as a result of it being virtual, you got quite a bit of attendance. I think there was like 60 people on there, and um, I think you got some really good input on that. So I think, first of all, well done. Um, second question is um, more of a getting into the weeds question. So the cold water goes beyond the proposed boundaries that you're proposing uh, in some cases. I think in, in almost all cases, it looks like that. So what criteria were you using to draw those boundaries? Because I, I think some of the fish are going to still congregate in that cold water outside of those boundary areas, correct? If, if not, and, and then the question is, what kind of criteria did you use to draw those potential boundary lines? Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, uh, the temperatures um, will, you know, dissipate as you get into the main stem on, along a gradient. Uh, obviously, the more water from the input, the larger it could be. Uh, it may vary depending on the flow year, how much water is in the Columbia, how much water is in the tributary, uh, up or down. What we're looking for, again, thinking about those boundaries, are things that are definable. Uh, and uh, in a, an amorphous plume in the river that can vary is hard to define, uh, recognizable by anglers uh, and enforceable uh, by law enforcement as well as the others. So trying to use things, uh, physical locations and markers that most or very closely match uh, those boundaries and provide, you know, the largest amount of coverage um, on that. So, for instance, on Eagle Creek, we would post signs. Uh, on the banks uh, and then use that uh, existing navigational aid out in the river to do that uh, and run it through there. In Herman Creek, uh, there's a tip of a jetty that provides an easy uh, marker boundary and we would put sign there, uh, sign on the shore to run that too. Uh, and then at the Deschutes, we have several sort of navigational aids that we can uh, run basically straight lines through our definitions and the anglers can see while they're on the water. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, last question. So I want to make sure I understand this. So the, the thinking is that we would look at a potential for a temporary rule in 2020. And then if it looks like that's something that the department wants to propose for later discussion, that would come back to us probably in 2021 for a permanent rule. Is that correct? Yeah, it would come back. Uh, so, Chair Wall, Commissioner Lavart, that's correct. Uh, temporary for 2020, uh, robust process, and then sometime in the fall of 2020 or early in 2021, back for a permanent rule uh, okay. decision by the commission. So, would you have a another public meeting or public input before dropping this temporary rule? Because you had mentioned that you like to get the word out ahead of time, so people have plenty of time to know what to expect. When would that happen or if it would happen? Chair Wall, Commissioner Labhart, I don't anticipate uh, additional public meetings for the temporary rule. Okay. Uh, we sort of committed that, uh, you know, communicated that at, uh, at that March meeting, yeah. uh, communicating it now at this meeting, and we will be sure to notice it and, and let people know via press release also. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Carter. Mr. Spellbrink. 
Uh, Chair Wall, uh, yeah, I thought maybe I'd respond a little bit to uh, uh, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Uh, he was asking about you know angler's opinion uh, on on these regs, and I thought maybe I'd just use this time to maybe educate her and others a little bit about that. You know, fishermen watch the the, the dam counts, and like last year when the dam counts were dismal, like they were. I mean, everybody, I think it's everybody I talked to that fishes that area up there was on board with it. They knew these fish need to be protected. Because so, so like say fishermen, you know, anybody that fish that area watches the dam counts below there. And so they know they know when the runs are poor. And so I, I think fishermen are all completely on board for the, mo the most part, because uh, you see exactly what's going over those dams and you know when there's a problem like there is now. And, uh, and then the other thing, yeah, one of my questions too was about the Washington side, because I know those Washington streams over there, the little white salmon and the big white salmon and the Klickitat and the Wind River are all come up. They're kind of glacier fed, so they're really cold streams. So I'm hoping that maybe Washington would uh, get on board with this a little bit too. I, that's the response I had. Mr. Woolley. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, so just kind of a side question on just additional impacts um, and other factors. It's kind of a question related to fish behavior. Uh, you mentioned fish ladders and that there is a temperature differential from the lower part of the ladder to the, to the upper. And so I was just wondering, just for my own education, what, what do the fish then do? Do they turn around and make another run at it later? Um, if so, what sort of stress is that on the fish? Is, is that this additional energy expenditure? Is this an issue or not? I mean, you mentioned ladders, so I just wanted to just see um, how they factor in. Thanks. Chair sure, Wall, Commissioner Woolley. Yeah, I think that this is an issue. Uh, fish, it can delay migrations. It can slow, it can stall it outright if they're too uh, too much of an issue, but in general, yeah, I mean, if you're slowing your migration and you have a body clock, especially if you're uh, a sockeye or um, or a fall chinook, uh, then that's additional stress and additional resources used. Um, they will sometimes still push through, but it, they just may not go as quickly. Uh, so yeah, it's additional stress and energy expenditure on that migration. Okay, thanks. That, that's all I need to know. Thank you. One last question, Tucker, that I had was EPA in their report emphasized um, the tribs providing the cool water, and that's why we have these sanctuaries, but that they depend on the habitat above them, clearly. And so for the three that you're proposing, for Herman and Eagle and the Deschutes, are you, is part of your discussion and part of your work looking at what we're doing or what we need to do to keep the sanctuary intact? that what we need to do in terms of habitat conservation to make sure that we would have these sanctuaries? Chair Wall, uh, I guess the short answer is no on that. Um, my work is, is looking at sort of the sanctuaries themselves uh, and making sure that we are reducing impacts in those uh, areas themselves. Um, other people, um, the water program might have a, a more uh, detailed answer for what we're doing uh, outside of there, but I am not engaged in that process. Thank you. Great report and um, look forward to hearing from you again soon on the temporary rule. Um, commissioners, we're at, at 12.15 or so. Can you keep going, thumbs up, can you keep going for the next one? And we just keep moving through this since we're not gonna have a lunch break. So we just keep moving. I'm getting enough thumbs up that we're gonna keep going. And so could we move then to Roblin Brown and the Wolf Report? Go ahead, Roblin, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher. I am Rob Lynn Brown. I am the Wolf Program Coordinator in LaGrand. I'll wait for Kristen. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. 
You can go to the next slide, Kristen. I will present the highlights of the Oregon Wolf Annual Report for 2019. I'll talk briefly about their legal status, the population, our monitoring efforts, and livestock depredation and public education. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kristen. This map represents how the legal status of wolves varies based on their location in the state. For federal status, we look at the gray striped area. I'm sure Kristen will get back to that map in a second. But we look at that gray striped area, which is the western three quarters of the state where wolves are listed as endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Just back two slides, thanks, thanks, perfect. Until they are delisted, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and ODFW work, through, work together to monitor wolves and implement non-lethal measures to reduce depredation. But only the US Fish and Wildlife Service has the authority to make decisions about harassment or lethal removal of wolves. In March, 2019, the US Fish and Wildlife Service published a proposed rule in the Federal Register to delist gray wolves. A final delisting rule is expected this year. Now for state legal status, wolves are delisted statewide and protected as a special status game mammal. The Oregon Wolf Conservation and Management Plan that was updated and approved by the commission in June of 2019 continues a three-phased approach to address both conservation management needs in eastern and western halves of Oregon based on the number of successfully reproducing packs. The red line, highways 97, 20, 395, separates the west and east wolf management zones. The west zone is still in phase one and will be until it has at least four breeding pairs for the consecutive years. In 2019, we had two pairs in the west zone that qualified as breeding pairs, so it will be at least three more years before the west zone moves to phase two. The east zone moved to phase two, uh, from phase two into phase three in 2017. It'll stay in phase three as long as there are at least seven breeding pairs. Next slide, please. Uh, if I may interrupt, Robin, I just wanted to let you know, I think there's a little bit of a delay that you're having in the viewing of your slides. So if you give it just a second, if it seems like I'm on the wrong, wrong slide, it'll uh, hopefully adjust. Thank you, Kristen, great. So Is everybody, yeah. <laughs> we're now seeing the minimum wolf number slide. Great. And have you been seeing it for a little bit because I just now saw it? Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. The statewide 2019 year end minimum count of wolves in Oregon is 158 individuals. This annual wolf count is done during the winter when individuals of a pack are most likely to be traveling together, so they are easier to count. Winter is also the lowest number of wolves during the year because the majority of pup mortality happens before winter. The minimum count is not an estimate based on a population model. This count is of known wolves verified through direct evidence. We located 22 packs at the end of the year. A pack is usually a family group, but for monitoring purposes, a, fact is four, a pack is four or more wolves traveling together during the winter. A pack is determined to be a breeding pair if an adult male, adult female, and at least two pups survived to December 31st. We documented 19 breeding pairs for 2019. We also counted nine groups of two or three wolves and seven individual wolves. Next slide. Okay, we're now showing minimum wolf number slide. <laughs> Thanks, I don't see it yet. This chart shows the annual minimum counts of wolves since 2009. You can see the increasing trend in the number of known wolves, including the 15% increase from 2018. Of course, there are more wolves in Oregon than 158. It's challenging to locate secretive carnivores and count each individual. As the population increases, it will not be practical or even necessary to count each wolf. This is why our Western states are developing models that estimate the population, as Oregon does for other wildlife and will in the future for wolves. Next slide. Okay, next slide is viewing. Okay, this graph shows the number of packs in yellow and the number of breeding pairs in orange. After the dip in 2016 and 2017, pack stability and reproductive success has improved. 
there was a 38% increase in packs compared to 2018. Of the two, 22 wolf pairs that bred in 2019, all but three raised at least two pups for the end of the year. That's a 27% increase over 2018. The percentage of packs that are successful as breeding pairs varies from year to year. Wolf pups are quite vulnerable to disease, accidents, and starvation and require a great deal of care from a pack. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Area. Wolves didn't just increase in numbers, they also increased in distribution. The blue areas indicate resident wolf activity, basically wolf territories. It could be a single wolf, a new pair, or a pack using the area. For example, in Western Oregon, there are just two wolves in the Silver Lake area, and then the other three gray or blue blobs, polygons, are three packs, the White River, Rogue, and the New Indigo Pack. About 10% of the wolf population is in Western Oregon. For years, we've wondered why the wolves left Northeast Oregon, crossed Interstate 84, and then dispersed all the way to Southwest Oregon or California without stopping in the Blue Mountains. In 2019, three new packs successfully bred in the Blue Mountains south of Interstate 84. Now it looks like the region is going to get colonized, uh, maybe in you know, the Southern Blues and Nochicos in the next few years. The new Hepner and Five Mile packs are just west of Highway 30, 395. They're in the federally listed area. This means that livestock producers there have less management options than ranchers just a few miles to the east. With these additional packs, there are now 27 wolves in the federally protected part of Oregon, up from, two, from 15 in 2018. With this map up, it's a good time to talk about OR7. OR7 caught the attention of thousands of people when he made the journey from far northeast Oregon to California and then back to southwest West Oregon with a radio collar to show us his locations. He started the rogue pack with a female that also found her way across the state. During the winter count, other wolves from the rogue pack have been seen on remote camera photos, but OR7 hasn't been detected since last fall, so he's not counted. While we do not know what may have happened, he is an 11-year-old wolf, which is quite old for a wolf in the wild, so it's possible he has died. This is a natural occurrence. Packs change over time as pups are born, the adults disperse, and breeders pass. This will, we will continue to monitor the area through cameras and DNA scat analysis to see if he may still be around. Next slide. Monitoring. ODFW continues to monitor the wolf population intensively so we can identify any threats to the small population early. I apologize for my slow connection, you guys. I'm in Northeast Oregon in, in Enterprise and it's my rural connection is probably not as good as yours. Thanks, Kristen. We collected almost 16,000 wolf location data points in 2019. This data was collected through remote camera photographs, scat track and howling surveys, and 34 radio collared wolves in 16 different groups, including 14 that were collared in 2019. We monitored five radio collared wolves dispersing during the year two dispersed to Idaho, three state in Oregon. And after years of Oregon radio callers heading to other states, we finally received one radio caller disperser from Washington last year. Next slide. Okay. There were seven known mortalities during 2019, same as 2018. This is a picture of OR27 in 2018. She was the breeding female of the Catherine pack for five years. She died of natural causes in spring of 2019 as a seven-year-old. The LSU Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory did an autopsy and determined she had severe bacterial, bacterial mammary infection, superative mastitis, which could have resulted in her death. The other six wolf deaths were human caused. Five wolves were killed by motor vehicle collisions, four on paved state highways, and one on a gravel county road. These are the first road kills documented in Oregon in 20 years when a radio collared wolf dispersing from Idaho was hit and killed in Baker County in 2000. One wolf was killed legally under the Caught in the Act regulations that allow a livestock producer to kill a wolf that is in the act of biting, wounding, killing, or chasing their livestock or livestock working dogs in the eastern one quarter of Oregon. No illegal kills were documented in Oregon last year. Next slide. Okay. In 2019, 16 of the investigations of dead or injured livestock were confirmed as wolf caused, a decrease from 28 the year before. In the federally protected area of Oregon, where lethal removal is not an option, the rogue pack was responsible for more than half of those depredations, eight calves and one livestock guardian dog were lost. In eastern Oregon, there were seven depredations, five packs depredated one time during the year, and one pack, the Behind Creek pack, depredated twice. 
That livestock producer did not request lethal removal. Instead, they increased their presence in the pasture even more. No wolves were lethally removed for chronic livestock depredation in 2019. Most packs do not depredate on livestock during the year. In 2019, more than 70% of the packs active during the year did not have any confirmed depredations. Next slide. Okay. The department needs to make depredation management a high priority. The intent is to minimize depredation while ensuring the conservation of wolves. We have expected the incidence of depredation to increase as the wolf population increased across the state. But this chart shows that the depredation has stayed low, that's the trend line in white, compared to the growth of the wolf population, that's the trend line in orange. It's hard to prove why this would be, but it's likely due to the bone pile cleanup and other adaptive livestock management efforts used by livestock producers. They deserve credit for expending time, energy, and money to reduce the vulnerability of their livestock. ODFW biologists did 50 livestock investigations in 11 counties. The yellow bars show the number of investigations and the resulting staff commitment has increased over time. Next slide. Okay. In 2019, Oregon legislative session, the state legislature and governor approved the hiring of three additional wolf staff. Funded by general fund dollars, these positions started at the end of 2019 and early 2020 and are located regionally in the Central Point, Pineville, and Enterprise offices. As a bonus, the Oregon Department of Agriculture was able to partially use these positions as a match in their request for federal depredation prevention grant funds. This increase in match aided in ODA, ODA being awarded $130,000 for depredation prevention this year, a twofold increase over last year. The new wolf positions will greatly increase the department's capacity for responding to human and wildlife conflict with wolves, livestock conflict with wolves. They will provide one-on-one -on -one technical advice for non-lethal implementation, follow up on public reports, and give presentations to agricultural, conservation, and other interested groups. They also implement wolf capture and monitoring. In 2019, staff collaboratively organized and presented as multiple workshops produced or focused on understanding wolf biology and sharing knowledge tools and techniques for protecting livestock from predators in small pasture and open range situations. The ODFW website continues to offer a one-stop shop for Oregonians to learn about wolves. It also offers resources for livestock producers, including maps of resident wolf activity and methods to reduce livestock vulnerability. Next slide. Okay. The online canid quiz we created in 2018 to help hunters identify between coyotes and wolves continued to be popular in 2019. To further educate Oregonians about wolves, we created a video with footage our 2019 student intern filmed when she had a wolf encounter while surveying an area for wolves. We get reports from recreationists and hunters that misinterpret wolf behavior, causing them to experience fear. With this video, we hope to help people better understand wolves so they know what to expect. We released the video on YouTube last October, and by March of this year, the video had 5.4 million views. Uh, the video can be viewed at the website shown on the bottom of the slide. Next slide. That's all I had, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Roblin. Um, great report and clearly, especially hard with the time lag. So thank you for that. Um, I'll go right to the commissioners. Commissioner Spellbrink, do you have questions? And then we'll we'll go to Commissioners Arnowitz and Labhart. No, no questions. Okay. Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, I just want to say this is a very good report, and it must have been hard to uh to be giving the report while not seeing the, the slides until several seconds later. But um, uh, I don't have any questions. I think you did a very thorough job. Thank you. Mr. Labhart. Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, um, this is probably a question for either Kurt or Erica or Shannon, and it's related to the budget positions. So I've had three positions been filled, first of all, and have you heard anything about, uh, because they're general fund positions, any potential for uh, having a negative impact on funding this program as the legislature directed? Well, this is Kurt. Um, those, yes, those positions are all filled. Uh, they are general fund funded. They are, are filled now and have been um, for, oh, I'm gonna 
want to say perhaps as long as six months. Um, as far as uh, the outlook, you know, at this point, we're not speculating. Uh, we'll be um, uh, looking at general fund um, revenues and, and uh, adjusting as we are directed. But uh, we, at this point, don't have any indication that um, they're going to reduce funding for positions that have folks in them. Thank you. Commissioner Hatfield Hyde and then Commissioner Woolley. Um, I just want to say I appreciate your presentation. Uh, I'm also on a uh, rural internet stream, so I, I understand, although it's been very steady today, which is is uh, is great. I also appreciate the um, the efforts to outreach to the communities. I think that's important and those um, extra positions are important and that ongoing communication, um, especially as uh, we continue to, um, you know, populate areas uh, that maybe haven't been populated before. Um, and I also um, just wanna say that uh, I look forward to the state managing this program across the state because I think it's a better fit for our communities. Thank you. Commissioner Willie. Um, thank you, Chair Wall. Just a couple of questions and a comment. Um, so what I'm recalling from the last, the previous winter count was that the population was static from the winter before that until the following winter. Um, it, but your graph showed that an increase. And it's, so I remember there was a lot of concern that, that it, it appeared that the population had not increased from the previous winter to that next one. Um, and I know there are a lot of variables involved with you know, winter conditions and methodology and that sort of thing. But I was wondering, well, just first of all, why, why are you showing something different than what we heard last year? Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, um, you're absolutely right. There was absolutely a stagnant period. It was between 2015 and 2016. In 2016, we had horrible weather conditions. We weren't able to get out on the ground to do much counting. Um, and we weren't able to get in the air. And then in 2017, we had a lot of breeding success, but we didn't towards the end of the year have much um, recruitment of young wolves. And so the numbers also did not go up great in that year. So it'll be slide six, five, sorry, slide, slide five. And so, we didn't have a great deal of increase that year because we have in 2017, we had seven breeders that were lost out of packs. So in that year, we had a lot of reproduction, but at the end of the year, we didn't have a lot of breeding pairs. And we had a lot of packs that broke up because they lost a breeder. And then so 2017 to 18 to 19, we're back to seeing a line similar to what we saw 2010 through 2014. But you're absolutely right. Um, Commissioner Woolley, we had a stagnant part there in 2015 to 16 with the population, and then it only slightly increased in 2017. If you go back to slide four, you'll see that system. Does, does that answer your question? Let's see. Uh, so, Commissioner Woolley, I think you're still on mute. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, thank you. That answered my question. And uh, my second question is about the road kills and how they're geographically distributed. Or do they do they tend to be concentrated in certain areas where were there multiple deaths on the same road, uh, or were they randomly distributed? Chair Wall, Commissioner Woolley, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's been a bit of a mystery to us all day, all year. Um, every single occurrence was in a separate, um, a separate occurrence, but two of them did happen on the same highway on Interstate 84 in Umatilla County, um, 10 months apart from each other. 
Um, so it, it is it is interesting that wolves have had trouble. We've been able to watch on the GPS collar data. They've had trouble getting across Intercity before for years. Um, some of them would never make it across. They'd run back and forth along the highway, and then they just take off in a different direction and go to Idaho or Washington. Um, so it wasn't really surprising to have wolves finally um, succumb to hit it, you know, getting hit on that interstate. Um, they've been trying for a long time. I think what we're seeing this year, though, is a little bit of a difference. We lost a pup in the Indigo Pack on, on Highway 138, I think it is, down there in Douglas County. And that is a pack that actually has a state highway going through it. And we haven't seen a lot of that in the past in Oregon. Most of our packs have never you know, really been crossing state highways on a regular basis. And that indigo pack does quite a bit. Um, so it's not too surprising to see a pup loss there. Um, the wolf that was hit up in Wasco County on Interstate on Highway 26 um, through the Confederated Tribe of Utility you know, Indian Reservation, or I'm sorry, through the Warm Springs Tribe. Um, that one is likely a dispersing wolf. Uh, it wasn't a wolf from the White River Pack. And so I think that there's always been a lot of loss to wolves. Um, it's been documented more in Washington and Idaho and Montana of dispersing wolves getting hit on highways. They may have come from a pack that simply did not have highways um, in the area. And so that's that's been a common loss as well. Okay, thank you. And um, one more question or just comment and question. So it appears that non-lethal efforts are working. I, I know that as Tucker said earlier, correlation does not necessarily imply causation, but it but it's really encouraging. Um, I know that in the past, some of the producers had stated that they had stopped um, making claims or uh, because they felt that they weren't being recognized or acknowledged. I know that we, we didn't have any last year. And um, so I just want to get your thoughts on that. Um, is it because non-lethal are working? Is it because uh, the depredation was felt by the producers that it, that it was too diff difficult to confirm? Uh, you know, sometimes they always, they haven't always had faith in, um, our, you know, our staff's work around that. So I just wondering if you, you know, had heard anything to kind of substantiate some of the, the difference this year uh, with the lack of, uh, you know, requests for lethal removal. I'll, I'll try and hit on all of that, uh, Commissioner Woolley. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I appreciate the chance to talk about it a little bit. Um, without a doubt, there are strategies that livestock producers can use to reduce the risk of livestock depredation. Absolutely. Um, removing attractants from an area where they may have um, winter feeding or calving pastures, re removing carcasses is a huge, huge thing that we've seen in Oregon that seems to, to help out a great deal. Um, that being said, there's other things that they can do in those wintering and calving pastures. Um, and then there's also the challenge of protecting livestock out in open range. And that's where I don't know that our numbers really accurately reflect the loss of livestock because sometimes they can simply never be found in those areas. Um, and those would be the areas where you may find um, a producer will say, I didn't report it um, because by the time they found it, it's possible that there might not have been much left. So they, they acknowledge that there wouldn't be a way to, to confirm that. And so without a doubt, in some areas, we get less calls um, based on the knowledge that the producers have about that. Um, we also have wolves moving into new areas um, and we'll get calls from livestock producers and we'll go out there and we'll confirm that wolves didn't have anything to do with this, um, but that's absolutely um, a great opportunity for us to have contact with a livestock producer and tell them what they're looking for and the things that they can do now that wolves are in their area and they can be, um, pay attention to that. Um, so without a doubt, non-lethal measures um, can be very, very helpful, especially if they're enacted before there's a challenge, before there's a problem. Um, but when you look at the map, for this year, and you look at the depredation, um, more than half of our depredation was from one pack in Western Oregon. And in Eastern Oregon, we had five packs that depredated once and one pack that depredated twice. And I think, I think that we need to acknowledge that there's a possibility the fact that we did lethal removal in the past in Eastern Oregon in those areas where we have really chronic depredation is, is part of the reasons why we have not so much depredation in those areas. Now, I'm not gonna say that lethal removal is the option every time to do, 
But sometimes when you have a pack that is chronically depredating and the numbers start to increase with that depredation, it's tough to use non-lethals, especially if it's open range depredation to reduce that depredation at that point. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roblin. Um, so we'll move then next to the, to the minutes. And to those of you in the public who are still listening, thank you for sticking with us. We have now the, the minutes and the temporary rules, both of which are action items. So let's go to the minutes. And I will assume that all the commissioners had a chance to glance at those. And so if there is a motion on the February minutes, that would be terrific. Would anyone like to anyone like to make a motion to accept the minutes? I move to accept the minutes. I don't have the exact language. I guess there would be corrections as needed. No, I would second that. Commissioner Spellbrink here. Okay. Yeah. So, so are there any questions about the minutes? Any uh, discussion? Any anyone feel that anything was omitted or needed to change before we vote? Those in favor then. Aye. 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 <laughs> Commissioner Wood? Aye. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, Commissioner Woolley. Um, then let's move to the temporary rules. Director Melcher, did you want to talk about these at all? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Wall. I, I um, will certainly stand by with any questions that you all may have. I think what you see here is, uh, is a collection of rules that are somewhat standard for us during this time frame as we manage the uh, Treaty Indian fishery as well as the non-Indian uh, recreational and commercial spring chinook fisheries, as well as um, uh, obviously a number of rules that are included here that are part of our response to the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. So other than that, no, I don't have any specific unless there's questions. And I did want to, and maybe we've already lost Rob Lynn, but I did also just want to uh, mention, and I, I think I say this every year at this time, but since we have a lot of new commissioners uh, this year at this time, I thought I'd say it again, that uh, this, this work, uh, this wolf census work is not easy work. And when um, you know, we have our staff like Rob Lynn and our district wildlife staff across the state out um, doing these counts either both directly as well as indirectly using technology, it's, it's not easy work. And I just wanted to uh, share my appreciation. I know you're all appreciation for that work that went on here over, over this last winter. So. Other than that, uh, thanks for indulging me and uh, happy to answer any, any questions you ha uh, have on the rules. Okay, commissioners, um, let's start with Commissioner Spellbrink. Are there any that you have questions on? Uh, no, no questions. And uh, again, uh, I think, you know, Kurt's had his hands full, but he's been, been doing a great job. Thank you. Commissioner Zarnowitz. I have no questions. I looked through them and they all looked like they were things that were needed. Commissioner Labhart. Well, uh, Director, you may want to just uh, summarize, because I didn't know this, that um, the authority that you're given during an emergency, so that the, at least the public knows um, what's, you know, what the process is when the governor declares emergency and what authority is given to you to do things, just to make sure it's clear for everybody. Um. Sure, I guess, uh, uh, and I don't recall the uh, statutory reference, but uh, I can certainly dig that up. I know I emailed it to you all um, several weeks ago. Um, the uh, Oregon, Oregon statute gives the director, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, a pretty broad authority during, um, during an emergency, uh, governor's declared emergency, or any emergency related to um, Fish and Wildlife Management. So uh, we've been using those authorities like we normally do with um, temporary rule adoption, but also um, 
where there were items that we would ordinarily bring to the commission that uh, we could not fit into the schedule. Uh, um, I've been using that authority as well. Um, so these rules that you have today are, are kind of a combination of, of both standard fishing related emergency rules as well as emergency rules implemented under their, our broader authority. Thank you. Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Sorry, takes me a minute to unmute. I'm fine to move forward with the rules. Thank you, Commissioner Woolley. Um, I'm fine with the rule. I just wanted to bring up a question that, that came up to me ab about this earlier. And it's about uh, people, Oregonians that don't meet a formal statutory requirement of resident for purposes of licenses, um, but they'd still like to participate in hunting and fishing. Uh, so I guess a couple of examples are like some of the professional guys or students or military. So they're, they're Oregonians in terms of, you know, where they are, but statutorily or may not be considered as residents. And so just want to know if anybody had any thoughts about that or if, if, if there's any clarification that's needed. Uh, so that's the, the question that's come up uh, during the week. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is Kurt. And uh, actually, we, we thought of that when we adopted the rule, Greg. And if you'll note in the rule, it says that it does not apply to people who live in the state but have not yet met, met the requirement, um, the non, or excuse me, the resident definition under our Fish and Wildlife um, licensing statutes. So for instance, um, we, have a, we have migrant communities that come here, they live here. Um, we are allowing them still to purchase non-resident licenses and participate because they live here. Um, you mentioned the military example. Those folks are, if, they, if they're living in Oregon, they can still buy a non-resident license and participate. Thank you. Okay, thanks for I have no other questions. Director Meltzer, I have three questions. I'm ready to move forward with the rules, but I do wanna ask three questions. I think they will be really quick questions. The first one is, for the, one, for the ones of the temporary rules that are driven by the, the Columbia Compact, if we did want to have meaningful input in any of those, at what point would it be, you know, should the commission look at the compact? Is that another one that is iterative and goes on all year so there really isn't a point where we could have, we could know what kind of policies we were trying to get forward in those negotiations? Or is it something we could actually have a spot where we could pay attention to the compact and what we were, Oregon was trying to negotiate in those? Uh, well, Chair Wall, the, the Columbia River Compact typically meets, um, I'm gonna ballpark it here and I'm gonna say up to 50 times per year. Got it. So um, the reason that the commission has delegated that authority to the director and the director has delegated that authority to the fish division is because um, none of us have the bandwidth to participate in 50 or more compact hearings. Sometimes the compact meets three times a week. Um, so, but, but that doesn't mean that the, but the compact is implementing regulations that are consistent with the policies that you all have adopted. So for instance, we have policies in place right now um, as it relates to non-Indian fisheries on the lower Columbia River. The compact is implementing fisheries consistent with those commission adopted policies. We have um, agreements with the Columbia River Treaty Tribes, both as part of United States versus Oregon under the court order, but also outside of that where the a compact is implementing seasons consistent with those um, overarching documents. So that's kind of the, that's the approach. Thank you. Second question is on the, where we're adding select area fishing periods, is that because there were more hatchery fish left in those areas and we wanted to try to 
increase the catch, if you will? Um, the select areas are managed with a, a set allocation of impacts on upriver spring Chinook, and they're actively managed throughout the season. So in many years, we are rescinding or taking away fishing opportunity because we, we monitor those impacts literally, uh, uh, in many cases, daily. Right. And so we're managing that fishery and where there are opportunities to expand fishing because impacts are are coming in lower than projected, we expand opportunity to make sure that we're one, maximizing the economic value to the uh, commercial fishery in those select areas, but also maximizing the probability that we're gonna catch all the hatchery fish and not have them uh, strain into other areas. Thank you, that helps. And the last one is on the, on the wild turkey populations, which is number 21, they've been increasing for quite a while. So I, again, I'm not, I, I want to move forward with everything that's in this package. So I'm not suggesting we take it out, but why is it this one an emergency? Well, um, I'm going to have to look at that one here and see. Yeah, if we have, um, I'm not sure if we have Doug Cotton on the line still. I may call on the on the wildlife division to answer that. I can bring Doug over. Am I there? Yes. Now, now you're here, I believe. Yes. Nope. Where'd you go? <laughs> Hold on just a moment. There we go. So Doug, you'll need to unmute yourself and you can share your video as well. Okay. Yeah. How's that? Looks good. Okay, so yeah, we, we had to do a temporary rule to allow our uh, wildlife control operators to operate inside city limits to deal with um, turkey problems. Uh, those turkeys, uh, our staff, we do not have enough staff to handle wildlife damage from turkeys and all the conflicts they're causing in some of our urban areas. We felt that this would be uh, a big step forward to trying to help at least some citizens with their, their turkey problems. Um, we do uh, still have the option of catching them alive and moving them. That will require uh, disease testing, however, uh, and if the turkeys are lethally removed, uh, they will be salvaged and uh, provided to food share or um, um, operations such as that. Any other questions? Doug? Beard looks good, very professorial. I like it. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Woolley. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just add to, uh, it's not just an urban issue. I live in Sisters, Doug, and there's probably 20 turkeys in our yard every day. So it's it's not just an urban issue, and it's even a rural issue too. So yeah, turkeys are pretty interesting little creatures. They love to be inside a city, so thanks. Thank you, Doug. I would agree. I have 24 at, at the school in Langlois, so. Um, that's it on the questions for that. So do I hear a motion on the temporary rules? I'd like to make I would move adoption of the temporary rules. Okay. I will second. And so those would be just for the record, Oregon administrative rules that the filed between February 8th, 2020 and April 15th, 2020. Okay. Um, should we do a count? I think Chris, just for the record, it's a little easier. We can go down the line uh, with our eyes. Uh, Commissioner Wall? Yes. Aye. Commissioner Spellberg? Aye. Commissioner Zonerwitz? Aye. Commissioner Lovehart? Aye. Is that everybody? Oh, no. and I, I say aye also? Aye. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hatfield-Hyde. Okay. 
So it's unanimous. So the administrative rule is passed. Thank you. Um, the only other thing left is um, other business and the statute that um, commissioner or that um, director Melcher referred to earlier is 496-118 that he sent out on the authority. And that's the question that commissioner Laphart asked. So any other business? Director Melcher, you look like you're ready to say something. I do have one other piece. It's very brief. And that is uh, just for the record. Uh, I think it was alluded to earlier, but uh, we are uh, postponing the May decision on the marbled Merlet uplisting. Um, we've worked with the plaintiffs in that litigation and um, we've submitted a joint motion to uh, the Lane County judge to uh, give us some additional time so that we can have a full, a full public process as opposed to having to do it through the awkward technology that we're using today. So likely that will come back in November um, at our November meeting. And we just have to hear from the court that they accept both sides asking for that? Uh, that is correct. As, as far as I know, we have not yet heard from the court but uh, we expect to hear affirmatively. Okay, hey, thank you. Anything else under other business? If not, thank you all for sticking with this long meeting. Thank you to the presenters very much for, for putting this together for us and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thank Thanks, you. Kristen. Yeah, great job. My pleasure. Appreciate it putting together. Thanks to all everybody that's listening in with bearing with us. We really prefer to be interacting with you in person and I know you like to interact with us. And, and so we hope we hopefully can get back on that uh, normal uh, as soon as possible. So thank you. Amen to that. Thank you all, talk to you soon. <laughs>